I think our discussion in these five talks will be rather more than usually important. For we hope to bring in a quantity of material involving principles and points of doctrine that we have never before discussed. And as a beginning, I would like to lay certain foundations. In the first place, however, we must bear in mind that it is very easy in an obscure area to fall into opinion or to interpret somewhat more broadly than the facts justify, especially if we work from some basic conviction of our own. Therefore, I'm not going to dogmatize any of these points, merely to bring out where possible the historical facts and certain almost inevitable conclusions. Each person, however, should weigh these almost inevitable remarks with the same uh, criticism and judgment uh, that they would use in evaluating any body of evidence or circumstantial record. I want to deal first with two very interesting and unusual centuries. That 200-year period from approximately 100 B.C. to 100 A.D. The more we become interested in comparative religion, the more we realize that this particular period has interest and importance in widely scattered areas of human culture. Of course, in the midst of this period, the Western world receives the impact of Christianity. But it must also be borne in mind uh, that the Christian faith for the first two or three centuries was a minority doctrine developing within a very restricted geographical and cultural area. We cannot, therefore, assume that Christianity of itself was responsible for all the other changes in distant regions, far from the possible contact with early Christian activity. Nor can we more readily assume that far and distant areas moved in upon the Mediterranean region uh, to completely change European culture. We must therefore move from a generality to be weighed and considered. We know that about 600 years before the beginning of the Christian era, a group of extraordinary religious and philosophical leaders arose within the space of a hundred years. Many of these men were contemporaries, and each left an indelible mark upon the culture of his own time and the area in which he lived. China received Confucius and Lao Tse, who were contemporaries, although Lao Tse was the elder man. During the very lifetime of these men, India received Buddha, another of the great teachers of the world. We have the suspicion that there was a marked renaissance of Persian culture about this time, perhaps under the last of the Zoroasters, who it is said Pythagoras of Samos was personally acquainted with. In Greece it was Pythagoras who established the foundations of the great age of philosophy, which may well be termed the golden age of Greek learning. Here were, here were a variety of impulses bestowed almost simultaneously in different parts of the world. From this period, there moves a cycle of approximately 600 years, let us say between 500 and 600. 
in each case within its own area these foundations laid in the sixth century bc began to mature and evolve and develop systems of thought we know what happened in greece and how the platonic philosophy rose definitely from the pythagorean theory we also realize that pythagoreanism and platonism became the dominant mediterranean philosophies and attained this distinction between the fourth century bc and the first century bc we also realize that in china the peculiar nature of confucianism caused it to remain a very steady and comparatively unchanging structure confucianism was almost totally an ethical conviction and it could scarcely be changed or outlawed any more than we could actually change the golden rule its very structure did not permit it to become much involved in any religious or abstract formula but Taoism, the teaching of Lao Tse, at about the beginning of the Christian era, moved from a philosophical to a theological foundation. And we find a tremendous expansion of Chinese metaphysics, coinciding closely with, say, the first century uh, AD. At about the same time, we find a tremendous internal change in the structure of Buddhism. We find as a result of the discovery of the mysterious secret books of Buddha in the Iron Tower by the Buddhist patriarch Nagarjuna, that Buddhism moved from a lofty philosophic agnosticism into a very involved, profound, and emotionally mature metaphysics with the advent of the pure land doctrine or the northern school Mahayana Buddhism as soon as Mahayana arose the entire course of Buddhist history changed and while there are still groups clinging strongly to the old way most of the progress in Buddhism has been the result of the Mahayana groups operating in China, Korea, and Japan. They have represented the spearhead of the modernism of religion in Asia. About the same period, there were marked changes in Hinduism. Uh, the rise of mystical and transcendental schools for the interpretation of the ancient Vedic and, Pur and Puranic writings. This change was also an enlargement into mysticism, a tremendous growth of metaphysical speculation, and the development of systems of meditation and various types of mystical experience doctrines, which were to play an important part in Asiatic culture. Even while Christianity was in its infancy, its direction was abruptly changed at almost the same time by the ministry of St. Paul. Uh, the Christianity of the four Gospels has gradually been absorbed into the Christology of the Epistles. And St. Paul stands forth as the person who transformed the moral code of Jesus into a highly transcendental universal doctrine of regeneration and redemption. Similar changes were occurring in Persian metaphysics, and we find the roots appearing also in Greek speculation. For about the beginning of the Christian era, the simple philosophic clarity of Plato's thinking became involved in the highly mystical speculations of the Neoplatonists and the Neopythagoreans seated in that melting pot of commerce and culture, the ancient North African city of Alexandria. Also in this same time, cross groups began to emerge 
mingling Greek thought with thinking of Christianity and producing such peculiar uh, groups as the Gnostics and the followers of Manes, the Manichaean group. In all of these instances, one simple point stands out. The gradual transformation of older doctrines into highly mystical revelations. Revelations that had one essential purpose behind them, and that was to change the concept of the transcendence of deity to the concept of the immanence of deity. This is a very important philosophical point. The mysterious God of old, or the godlings of ancient times, living in their remote Olympian or Samurian heights, uh, were a race of beings apart, inhabitants of heaven. But in this gradual change that took place, deity was transformed into an eternal power, everywhere present, always invisible, beyond definition, yet immediately available through certain transcendent achievements of human consciousness. We know that this change marked not only uh, the shift in the psychological integration of the Mediterranean region, but that it swept across the world. There are even vestiges of this change occurring in the Western Hemisphere among the primitive peoples, perhaps not so primitive peoples, of Central America. We find a gradual tendency to associate the rise of religious mysticism among the Mayas at a time approximating the beginning of the Christian era. This phenomenon was so remarkable that Lord Kingsborough one of the greatest 19th century authorities on Central American culture, felt that it was almost certain that the mysterious deity Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, who came so strangely to Mexico, must have been one of the original apostles. In other words, there seemed no other way of explaining this, because there was no common communication between these peoples. Yet at almost one time, they all came to an almost identical conclusion, changed their entire religious course, and transformed the structure of religion from its archaic form to the type of religious understanding which we share and enjoy today. Now this obviously opens a very large area of speculation. There are many possible explanations, some rather impossible, which have still held a measure of favor. One broadly accepted uh, doctrine relating to this, or explanation for the circumstances, is the idea of coincidental emergence. We have parallels of this in simpler ways. We frequently hear, for example, of an invention that has been offered to the world, and it is not uncommon that the same invention shall appear in, the, in different places at the same time, several persons coming to almost identical conclusion and at almost the identical moment. Therefore, the coincidence concept is not quite as loose as might first appear, for it is based upon the assumption that time is measured by a series of events, and that whenever a culture or a group of persons or a civilization passes through certain experiences, there are corresponding innovations in that culture, changes in its doctrines and beliefs. Perhaps the interval of 600 years between the advent of the great teachers and the beginning of the Christian era brought several nations 
or several culture groups to almost the same psychological platform. And there was no direction in which they could go except that direction which is most natural and common to human nature. Another explanation which requires perhaps a little more investigation is the concept that these changes were tied together. That actually there was greater commerce between these ancient cultures than we at this time assume to have existed. That it is quite possible that by the beginning of the Christian era a degree of world thought had been established, particularly along the caravan routes. And it is interesting that most of these innovations rose in regions along the caravan lines between Europe and Asia. Therefore, it is conceivable that Asiatics did visit uh, Western centers of learning. It is also quite possible that more Europeans visited Asia than we now realize. We know that Pythagoras was able in the 6th century BC to reach India. We know that the armies of Alexander the Great penetrated Asia. We do not know just how largely these motions contributed to world ideas. But one thing we can generally regard as undeniable that the world of cultured, civilized nations came to about the same ideas at almost the same time. Of course, to the uh, devout transcendentalist or metaphysician, there is no problem at all. All these things are handled by invisible forces beyond human comprehension. Uh, we do not deny such a possibility, but we also like to see, if possible, some uh, more simple and explainable procedure. Uh, these transcendental solutions belong to the divine emergencies, and I would rather see, first, if we cannot find some common ground for assuming that these changes were made by at least partially natural means. And I think we can rather well establish this. Now, you may wonder why all this has a bearing upon the Kabbalah and the doctrines of the early Jewish peoples. The importance lies in this very circumstance, namely, that Kabbalism is perhaps the broadest term that we have for Jewish transcendentalism. Kabbalism is to the old Orthodox Jewish belief almost in the same relationship as Mahayana Buddhism to primitive Buddhism in India, or the theological Taoism to the primitive absolutism of Lao Tse. In each instance, we see the arising of a new point of view. And in the case of the Kabbalists, uh, this presents a semi-Western face for our examination. It is a rather compact package. It involves a limited group of persons, yet it is wonderfully symbolical of the entire world procedure. Not only are we concerned with these extraordinary coincidences and the timing, but we are also somewhat concerned with the internal symbolism of the various revelations that arose in a half a dozen areas of world culture at the same time. In the symbolism, we also seem to sense a relatedness. The symbolism would almost suggest that a number of people had read the same book or had become aware of the same basic facts or had attained to the same basic conviction and had then unfolded this illumination 
in terms familiar to their own people or in terms at least partly acceptable to the entrenched traditionalism of the areas in which they existed. For we must realize that all of these groups were opposed as they rose. They all passed through certain persecutions. They created resentments. They were declared to be heretical by someone. And perhaps it was this very persecution that gave to each of them the strong substance of survival. For we know things under persecution develop a tremendous strength and an integration that can never be found in more fortunate uh, environments. So we have now a world situation. And I, I think that the Dead Sea Scrolls situation uh, more or less fits into this. Uh, these scrolls are assumed to have been originally um, preserved or put away in the earth sometime in this interval between 100 B.C. and 100 A.D. We also have to remember that in these scrolls there are strong indications of a, of a heterodox attitude arising among Jewish mystical sects. I am no way convinced that these scrolls are Essene products. I do not think the Essenian community can be actually the source of them, although it may well have been the preserver of the old manuscripts. The Essenes themselves were a transition group between Orthodox Judaism and mysticism, and their entire history is noted only in these two mysterious centuries. After that, they disappear utterly from the pages of record and account. We do not know what happened to them, but they form part of this strange bridge of doctrines that seem to connect an old world with a new concept of life. How shall we distinguish this new concept of life for instance, in terms of our Kabbalism. The great book of the Kabbalah, certainly its outstanding text today, is the Sefer HaZohar, or the Book of the Splendors. This was first given to the world around the 12th or 13th century by Rabbi Moses de Leon. He insisted that he transcribed it from an ancient work. For nearly 300 years, perhaps 400 years, historians have thrown the lie to his teeth. They have said that Rabbi Moses wrote the work himself, that it had no roots in antiquity, and probably little, if any, roots in tradition. However, in the last century, our broadening knowledge of world culture has caused a general change of opinion, and even so conservative a publication as the Encyclopedia Britannica, which can never be said to give much benefit uh, to abstractions. Uh, their article on the Kabbalah uh, states as the modern point of view that it is very probable that Rabbi Moses of Leon either was in possession of an earlier manuscript or was in possession of a valid oral tradition, and that in all probabilities he was perfectly honest and perfectly sincere and entirely truthful in attributing the Zohar to a very much earlier date than the medieval scholars had admitted. According to Rabbi Moses, this work was actually uh, written about the beginning of the Christian era, just at this particularly critical time during the reign of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Persecuted by the Romans and by the more traditionally bound members of the Sanhedrin, Rabbi Simeon ben Yochoi retired to a cave with his son 
And in this cave he was visited by one of the angelic hosts. And through this angelic visitor and the intercession of the early prophets, he is said to have recorded the Book of the Splendors, the Sefer HaZohar. We have at this time no reason to doubt that this book is a genuine midrash of Rabbi Simeon. That is, it was a work prepared by him, or at least committed to memory as the result of instruction which he gave. This particular work changed the entire complexion of Jewish thought. It belongs just as certainly to this transition period as the wonderful books found by Nagarjuna in the Iron Tower in India at almost exactly the same date. All this adds to the concept that prevails in the writings of Rabbi Simeon and in a parallel group of material prepared by Rabbi Akiba. A little later, Philo Judaeus, the most articulate philosophical spokesman of the Greco-Jewish school, uh, expanded this concept of Jewish mysticism far more uh, than had been previously possible and mingled its courses very closely with Neoplatonism. This was a very interesting time, a time of strange beliefs. Each people, in its own way, has explained the reason why that particular period should have produced these curious consequences. But there must have been some broader underlying generality which binds these together and makes them into one united idea. For example, among the teachings that arose among the Kabbalists, and probably uh, may be traced back to Simeon ben Yochoi in the first century, is the doctrine of Gilgulam. This particular doctrine is not commonly found in the West during the period of uh, the so-called rise of Kabbalism. The word simply means the doctrine of rebirth. Now, the Orthodox Jewish people uh, had certain beliefs about this, uh, but they were not at all clearly defined. It is held that the Pharisees did hold this doctrine in some estimation, and certain sects also regarded it highly. But with the rise of Kabbalism, it burst upon the philosophic mind of Europe. Now here's one of the points which I think we are mentioning perhaps for the first time, and that is the descent of the doctrine of rebirth in Europe from the fall of the Greek schools to the rise of modern knowledge. This doctrine was perpetuated in Europe. It was perpetuated not only by Jewish Kabbalists, but by Christian Kabbalists. And there was a thin thread of this belief, even in the Dark Ages, and in the period of the Renaissance, and down through the dawn of the modern way of thinking, with its indebtedness to Galileo, Harvey, Descartes, and other dawn thinkers of our modern generation. So this teaching suddenly flares up among the Jewish mystics. Why? How is it that a doctrine which had so little sympathy from their Christian neighbors and so little support from the Torah should have been developed in such exquisite detail in the Sefer HaZohar? This book was widely read and was widely influential among the literary-minded Jewish people. It attacked many principles of orthodox Jewry. It did not permit much of the psychological pattern that has always dominated Jewish personal and family life. It violated, in many respects, at least the prevalent interpretations of the Torah 
and the Mosaic Code. Yet it flourished in Spain, in Italy, in France, and was held by a large number of scholarly believers all the way down through the reigns of the Medicis and the Borgias. It's almost incredible to assume that a whole series of these doctrines moving westward, doctrines which were essentially so close to the Asiatic pattern of life, could simply have come from nowhere, or merely represented the speculations of single persons. Here we have another example of the development of traditions. These traditions bore very heavily upon the nature of the divine being at the root of life. And in the rise of the Zohar, we see the Jewish concept of deity undergoing marked changes, changes which were later to profoundly influence the Christian faith. How did these changes arise and where did they come from? Were they indigenous to Europe or the Near East, or did they come from far Asia? As time goes on, I believe the general tendency will be to suspect far Asia. I think we will gradually be forced by the development of more adequate records uh, to recognize that religion is a common motion, and that it is like a river that may flow through one country but have its headwaters in another. And this um, diffusion of ideas was possible at the time with which we are most concerned. And it is very possible that the reason for this sudden outburst of similar doctrine in assorted regions came as the result of the maturing or developing of more adequate travel facilities, particularly uh, the increase of caravan trade. Uh, the trade was to provide luxuries for the Romans and the Latins. But the byproduct was the communication of ideas, for these traders brought with them their beliefs and their doctrines. We know that this trading process a few centuries later was to be the principal foundation for the rise of Islam. But for our present concern, I think the transformation of the nature of deity is the first matter to be considered. Our primitive ancestors gradually passed from the worship of nature to the worship of spirits, from the recognition of visible forces to the acceptance of invisible causes behind or beyond these forces. These causes themselves passed through innumerable reformations on the part of man. As his experience increased, it became essential to revise his theology, to keep his theology abreast of his intellectual achievements and his physical experiences. Gradually, the concept of deity as represented in the Mosaic Code took form, not in one area, but in many areas. And deity emerged as a being, a transcendent person. As the system was patriarchal, the deity assumed the aspect of the great father power. It was usually personified or impersonated as a most venerable person, a great superhuman being, a being, however, fashioned in the likeness of a man, a being like the mysterious and noble figure casting from his hands the sun and moon, as represented on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. This being was the great patriarch, and was compounded out of the elders, the heroes of long ago, the fathers of tribes, the venerated sages and scholars, the great priests and saints of long ago. 
All of these contributed their parts to the creation of the God image. And this God image was great of power, universal of authority, but subject, like the creatures that fashioned it, to the whimsies of disposition and temperament, subject naturally uh, to favoritism in bringing particular advantage and security to its chosen people. This God image was remote, like perhaps the great golden figure of Zeus at Olympus. It was power, but it was a power inscrutable, a power with which man could have very little intimate understanding association. It was a power that ran all things according to its own will. And in this power, men were but pawns in a great game. The gods could sweep away men merely by the will to do so. And these gods lived in a heaven world or region far from the abode of men, even though, like ancient Odin, they occasionally seated themselves upon the throne of all seeing and looked out upon the world to see that it was still in order. We find this kind of deity not only arising in the Near East, but having already arisen in other ancient regions as Egypt, India, and China. We find roots of it in the nature worship of Japan, Shinto. We see, therefore, God as the ancestor. We see God as the Ancient One, and we also lived in a world ruled by certain inscrutable laws and processes, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This God was a God of justice and of vengeance. This was the deity who men did not dare to offend. They could respect. They could fall in awe before the thought or image of this God, but they could not meet it with personal affection. It was too distant and too far, too high, too remote, uh, to have any immediate part in the workings of the world. This concept also had another frailty about it, which men, as they grew wiser, began to contemplate. There was a weakness in this God. For this deity, living alone in an inscrutable internal remoteness, was assumed to be the parent of creation. In the first place, man was unable to explain how or even why God should create. There seemed to be no particular reason for it, and the more men studied the creation, particularly other men, the more doubt they had in the divine wisdom in creating man in the first place. There were many legends that Deity so repented of this optimistic moment uh, that he swept away his creation time and time again. This uh, problem also caused the great question to arise. From what was creation fashioned? Did creation actually emerge as a result of a divine fiat spoken in space by some vast shadowy being, like that portrayed by Gustave Doré in some of his wonderful uh, paintings? Was creation from something or nothing? From what did the eternal creator fashion his world. Was the world created, or had it always existed? Was deity merely one of a body of immortal beings that, like existence itself, had no beginning and no end? The problem of trying to rationalize the fashioning of a world by this strange and mysterious power, confused and confounded 
the ablest thinkers of all time. They could uh, figure nothing more than a symbolical answer, like the tossing off of the sun in front and the moon behind. This, however, did not fully satisfy the rising realization of the principles of astronomy. There had to be some other explanation. This explanation uh, needed also a warmth in it. And if we look back on primitive religion, we see that there was an astonishing lack of real warmth. Men worshipped, but some way this worship was like the respect of a small child to an overstern parent. It was a respect of fear. This deity was wonderful and awful. It was a being which no one dared to offend. It was a father, however, in name only, for no one brought their troubles to this father. They brought offerings, they propitiated, they prayed, but they never felt a kinship with infinite life. This was long regarded as one of the basic weaknesses of Greek religion. Of all the religions of that period, probably the Greek was the most pleasant. It was the happiest. It was a worship of nature, and the rituals were well arranged, so there were festivities for every season. But even so, this did not represent a real sense of intimate experience. It was not until the rise of the Orphics that the human being in Greece had any real spiritual significance. He died and became a shadow. He had neither punishment nor reward in the world to come. He came forth as a flower and was cut down. And that was the story of it. It was only after philosophy began to ripen these concepts and the human heart began to sense an internal need that it turned away from the strange theological materialism of antiquity. This does not mean that the ancients had no God, but they had no personal God experience. They only worshipped before the temple. They never seemed to go in to find that which was hidden in the Aditam. They did not walk with God. Perhaps the old story that before the fall of man, God walked in the garden in the cool of the evening, carried some remembrance of other and better ways. But in the great rise of theology, God did not walk with men. He ruled them. He governed them. He punished them and rewarded them according to his own will and fancy. Now it is quite possible that at a certain degree of cultural insight, many nations simultaneously outgrew this concept. We know that most of the countries where these changes took place were comparatively advanced in their sciences, their literature, their art, their poetry, their drama, and in their morality and ethics. Regardless of this particular point, however, we know they all did come to this immediate sensing of a great and wonderful need. To meet this need, a new type of thinking had to be devised. For there was a very deep problem here, one that the modern world probably will never fully comprehend or with which we may again be confronted one of these days when we make a sudden shift from materialism to idealism. If we produce a culture which remains materialistic for several centuries, and then this culture out of emergency within itself seeks to reestablish its own spiritual foundations, we may know something of what these peoples went through 2,000 years ago because it required a tremendous shift of perspective. 
One of the important uh, phases of this shift was the relationship between the individual and his own personal responsibilities. In the ancient world, the gods bestowed or withheld. Their ways were not only inscrutable, but as far as man was concerned, unreasonable. There seemed to be no particular way of explaining why the unjust seemed to flourish and the just to suffer. There seemed to be no reasonable explanation for the disasters and tragedies of human existence. Therefore, it seemed reasonable to assume that a deity, perhaps with insight beyond our own, was the administrator of all this wonderful complexity. But about the beginning of the Christian era, there came into existence the tremendous sense of personal responsibility for destiny. It shines out at us through all of these different systems. Man's fate moves slowly into man's own keeping. This was not a sudden move, but it was a rapid one. And in this concept it was necessary to revise previous attitudes. So we see a, a marked change in uh, a number of beliefs. One of these marked changes included the rise of at least an archetypal form of the messianic dispensation. All of these peoples suddenly became aware of a power of intercession in space. This is particularly obvious in the Jewish instance, for among these people the power of intercession had been comparatively slightly developed as a doctrine, but among the Kabbalists it arises in a very powerful way. We find also in India the strict teachings of Buddha are enlarged. Uh, Buddha passed through two processes after his death. By one of these processes he was deified, and by the other process he was, uh, we will say, absorbed into a structure of bodhisattvas, of celestial beings and attendants. <coughs> who ministered to the spiritual needs of mankind. A savior concept emerged. Now at almost exactly the time of the rise of the mystical dispensation in Christendom, the uh, Buddhist concept evolved their belief in a deity whom they called Amitabha, the Buddha of boundless light. This Amitabha power uh, was seated like a remote deity in the effulgency of space, but Amitabha was not a god in fact or substance. Amitabha was a human being deified by merit. After Amitabha had preserved his vow, or kept his great vow, which he made before attaining to the estate of an Arhat. He became uh, the ruler of the Golden Land, the land of peace, the New Jerusalem of Christianity, the city of four square, represented often in this actual way in China, Tibet, and Japan. Amitabha then caused to emerge from his own nature the Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara his beloved son. This Bodhisattva became his representative, his intercessor, and it is in the keeping of this Bodhisattva that Amitabha entrusted his world, and it was the duty and responsibility of Avalokitesvara to bring all souls to salvation through the grace of his own nature. Now this concept was in vogue in Asia 
rising mysteriously and miraculously in the first century A.D. Avalakita's Vara later becomes a male-female being, and in China and Japan is often disassociated entirely from its masculine attributes to become Kuan Yin or Kan Nan, a purely feminine representation now depicted carrying a small child in her arms. And uh, this particular circumstance so disconcerted the first Christian missionaries in the area that they were convinced that in some way these people were perverting the idea of the Virgin Mary. But here we have this concept arising on the opposite side of the world. We have a similar concept gradually unfolding into the later religion of the Egyptians where a comparatively unimportant local deity, Osiris, finally became the principal deity of Egypt, and uh, then became the father of his own mysteriously, immaculately conceived son, Horus, who in turn becomes the savior of the world. The story of Horus is almost identically, the, in function, the story of Avalakita's father. We find also in many other systems either personified beings representing salvation, as in the emergence of the Persian Mithras, but we also find the rise of doctrines of salvation revealed by beings who so loved mankind that they opened the royal roads of revelation. The whole picture fits together in a strange and interesting manner. Now in the beginning of Amidaism, as it is called in Japan, or the doctrine of Amitabha, we have the meaning. The Amitabha exists in two forms in Chinese Tibetan philosophy. One is Amitabha, the, the Buddha of boundless light. The other is Amitayas, the Buddha of boundless life. These two are reflexes of each other, and in the Tibetan art are regarded as aspects of one being. And the word was light, and the light was the life of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. This is practically a Christian statement of Buddhist philosophy. Now how did the doctrine get across? Or, let us go to the Kabbalah now. The Kabbalists no longer accepted the mysterious name of deity that is concealed under the acrostic of the Tetragrammaton, or the great name of four letters, which we have translated Jehovah. They declared that the mysterious power at the root of life, the Ancient of Days, that power which is eternal and immovable, is of a triadic nature, represented by three words, ain, boundlessness, that is, that which is foreverness of its own eternal nature, that which goes on without beginning or end, representing an essence, a principle unchanging unto infinity that never this power was born, that this power shall never die. But very much like the effort made by Aristotle to establish the causelessness of first cause, simply represents the fact that causation is itself eternal, that causation is both a motion and a substance, existing forever. This is almost identically the statement of Lao Tzu in, des in describing the nature of Tao. And this was the same doctrine which at the beginning of the first century took over in China, at about the same period that we find it rising in North Africa, the Near East, and Southern Europe. Out of the nature of Ain comes Ain Sof. And Ain Sof is the boundless life. And out of the boundless life comes Ain Sofer in the ancient Kabbalah. 
and that is the boundless light. So being life and light constitute the basic triad of the Kabbalah. Being life and light constitute the basic triad of Mahayana Buddhism. There is no essential difference. There is only such difference as would be inevitably the result of translation from one language to another. So Buddhism no longer remained a doctrine of the world of illusion and the total reality of a nirvana beyond. It now became a world filled with being, life, and light. And this triad became gradually further exemplified out of the nature of Amitayas, Amitabha, by the rise of this triad consisting of Amitayas, Avalokitesvara, and Daisechi. The, the being... This being consists of essence, of a super-substantiality, a changelessness. And this being exists in the innermost and the furthermost. It is diffused beyond dimension. It is called a zoic, in that it has no place nor placelessness. This being, then, suddenly steps out of the heavens as a person and steps into the atom. And that is where the Chinese put it, that is where the Hindu put it, and that is where Buddha himself said it was, because he actually referred to the atom by name in one of his discourses. Thus we have now a power as an absolute diffused ends or quality, a power from which nothing can be either more distant or more proximate, <coughs> that actually, therefore, deity is the substance from which all substances arise. Deity is substance and substantiality. Deity is not only the creator but in his own nature and substance, the very material of creation. Therefore, God truly creates all things within his own likeness. And within this likeness, all things live and move and have their being. You can see quickly how this would shift the perspective from transcendence to eminence. For instead of deity being here or there, which was, of course, one of the great problems of Omar Khayyam, deity is always everywhere. The Hindus gradually developed the concept in relation to Brahma, who ceased to be a three- or four-headed deity seated on a lotus, and became the symbol of the all-pervading presence of universal substance. Now, when we refer to substance, in this case, we do not mean matter. By substance, we mean that which is substantial, or has a reality in itself. That which is not substantial is that to which a reality must be conferred. Therefore, that which is in itself, innately, the cause, the substance, the sustenance, and the power of itself may be said to be substantial. This substantiality carried with it into infinite diffusion its own essential properties. Therefore, every inconceivable or conceivable unit of energy or of substance or of essence anywhere in existence was itself triadic, consisting in its own nature of the essential completeness of the Godhead. This Godhead being the principle of being, the principle of life, and the principle of light. Uh, the ancients, and especially the Kabbalists, of course, would never leave even such words as life and light, 
without going into the gematria and the notoricon of them. They had to go into the mystery, for to them everything was a mystery. Every example of life was mysterious in this sense, as they themselves expressed it, that mystery is the vestment of eternity. Therefore, to discover reality, we must always penetrate mystery. If we penetrate mystery, we become wise. If mystery penetrates us, we become stupid. It is a very simple principle, but a very interesting one. Therefore, we are continually seeking to penetrate mystery. And in this mystery, we are seeking substance, essence, nature, being. To this triune nature, therefore, it became appropriate to bestow the term the Ancient of Days. It became a symbol of absolute antiquity as a solution to a problem. For to man, the problem of cause was more significant and more difficult than the problem of continuance. It would be simple to conceive of deity as ever-present under this system, but it would be more difficult to use this concept to explain first cause. Therefore, in their interpretation, the Kabbalists began to explore the meanings of life, light, and being in order to answer these essential root questions. We have already more or less summarized their idea of Ain, or being, the absolute profundity, the eternity of things. Not an eternity of time alone, but an eternity of condition and an eternity of limitlessness, so that this eternity had within it at all times the roots and rudiments of an emergence or a coming forth. Thus the Pythagoreans gradually developed the, the concept of, the, of being as seminal or full of seed, like the mysterious statue of Serapis in Alexandria the body of which was covered with growing plants. Life to these people meant the emergence of active creative processes. Things become alive when they move, when they bear fruit, when they continue. The first manifestation of life is involved with continuance. Therefore, absolute life is absolute continuance, which again relates to essence or total immortality. Uh, life, therefore, is manifested as a continuing unfoldment of the divine nature within itself, from itself, and by means of its own power. Light to these ancient peoples carried more than the illumination of the sun or the separation between day and night. Light to them was the light of internal comprehension. Therefore, into this mystery of creatures was introduced the element of comprehension, so that these creatures could know, could be aware, could ultimately become conscious. And the end of light was that it should reveal the nature of the creating power. For the final purpose of light was that it should reveal truth. And truth in this system is nothing more than the total statement of the reality of being. Consequently, they had a very interesting and dynamic uh, interpretation of what had once been an almost unassailed uh, vastness of speculation. Uh, no man had dared to think of Zeus as other than an ancient bearded tyrant. But now came this new concept, the concept of the God of the Kabbalah, as appropriate, rep appropriately represented as paternal, because of the absolute paternity of being. But this paternity now manifested through an absolute involvement in creation. 
In this way, it was possible to bridge the mysterious interval between God and man. It brought God and man together somewhere. And it also brought creation and creator uh, into the power of creating, which was their common uh, meeting place. This concept made way for mysticism as we know it. It made way for the possibility of the God experience in man. For if God dwelt in man as a, an essence uh, embodying or containing life and light, then this essential being could be, under some condition, knowable by man. Now the problem of knowability uh, in, recognized this uh, important special phase. Namely, that to know a thing, one must be that thing which is known. And man's power to know God resides in the beingness of God in man. Man is therefore truly an expression, interpretation, revelation, not of himself, but of deity. And all things are merely deity unfolding its own eternity. We find traces of Neoplatonism here. We find traces of Buddhism, of Hinduism. We find a whole variety of ancient beliefs moving in and forming a unit within this rising Kabbalistic concept of existence. The next point, naturally, was the effort to establish a practical working definition of deity. The Kabbalists evaded this, as nearly all other mystics have, on the ground of incomprehensibility. Actually, the only power which can be aware of itself is deity. All other powers have to be essentially aware of something that is not self. Therefore, man's inability to find his own source apart from God. The individual trying to be himself achieves nothing because this self cannot be known apart from God due to the fact that this true self is God. This was a Buddhist point also. That the individual seeking to posit his own nature at the root of life simply desecrates the divine nature. The individual who feels that he rises from his own causes has missed the essential principle of mysticism, namely that all things have but one cause in common, and that cause is the divine nature in themselves. We see this in Vedanta, we see it in yoga, we see it rising in the disciplines of Tantra. All of these schools gradually converge upon these essential principles. The next point that perhaps uh, might concern us is this bridging from the atom which is God, the infinite atom of infinite greatness, the infinite atom of infinite smallness, both united, however, by both the state of infinite and by the state of structure. Both are strangely uh, atomic in their institution, in their uh, formation. To bridge this, how is it to be crossed? The Buddhists, the Taoists, the Kabbalists all come to the same conclusion, and St. Paul speaks loudly the same thought in connection with the experience of Christ, namely that there is only one way in which deity can be experienced, and that is through the individual gradually retiring into the innermost sanctuary of his own life, and there gradually ceasing to be himself. And in the complete cessation of himself lies the experience of divinity. Therefore, this experience is impossible to the egotist or the egocentric individual. This was one of the strong points of Buddhism and is one of the essential doctrines of the Kabbalah. 
that the only way the individual can come finally along the 49 paths that lead to the mysterious ancient is a series of renunciations, a dropping away of humanity, and a corresponding enlargement of the experience of divinity. It is a reversal of the evolutionary procedure as we know it. It is a return uh, to a primordial and eternal condition. Now, both East and West have their explanations for the significance of this journey. Some may say that as long as man has emerged from the divine nature, uh, that man might as well continue to emerge and might go on and on and on to infinite individuality. Most systems have denied this, however, because this eternal continuance of self assails one of the absolute prerogatives of deity, namely that deity and deity alone is immortal. Therefore, any human being striving for immortality can attain this end legitimately only by re-identification with deity itself. A separate immortality was inconceivable both to the Kabbalists and the Buddhists. And to a measure it was also inconceivable to the Christian of this period. It has still remained a very great question in theology. But most mystics have always assumed that the ultimate state of man has to be re-identification with deity inasmuch as there is no other conceivable end, as all bodies must go down to the common earth, so all spirits must return to the common father. There is no other end. This common father, this eternal unconditioned essence, as represented in both East and Western metaphysics, should have led and could have led to one of the most practical of all results, namely the recognition of the identity of all religious belief. But for some reason it didn't quite get there. The reason it didn't get there, according to both systems, rests in the concept of egoism. The concept that the individual has an enduring existence of himself and is able to confer this separate survival upon his own institutions, which he has never yet quite been able to demonstrate. It is to the uh, individualist, therefore, that the concept of a desirable individual destiny holds the greatest attraction. But to those who have studied the most abstract forms of religious idealism are in common accord that the noblest religious concept that we have today must be, as Paul says, uh, quoting from the Roman poet concerning the nature of God, we are his children. That it is like the parable son of the prodigal son returning to his father's house, that in the end all things return to the earth or to God. Therefore, in a sense, deity becomes a symbol of earth, an earth of deity. For as earth swallows up the dead, so deity absorbs the living. There cannot be anything left suspended between these opposites and going nowhere. In the Jewish mysticism, the development of the great concept resulted also in a secondary god form. This secondary god form was called Macroprosophus, or the long face. The Macroprosophus represented the revelation of deity in the creation process. And there emerged out of the mystery of infinite being the gigantic figure like the giant of the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, a mysterious and colossal figure with one foot upon the oceans and the other upon the land, around whose body the stars and planets moved, and whose face was always in profile, because deity was re represented always with one eye. 
This mysterious macroprosophus, or the long face, was the clothed God. No longer clothed as an old gentleman, uh, even with the most ecclesiastical abilements, <coughs> but clothed in creation. God as creation. God as cosmos as an infinite diversity of universes and solar systems, as made up of a great cluster of stars holding in its hand the jewel of the universal cosmic galaxy. The vestments of this being were like the radiant fringe of the Milky Way, and it was surrounded by angels full of eyes, which were the stars, and its vehicle was the Merkava of Ezekiel, the chariot of righteousness. And in the midst of this great machinery of the universe sat the ancient of the most ancients, the power at the root of all things, unchangeable and in its own visage unknowable. We now have Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sofair revealed through the great face with its threefold forked beard, the hairs of the beard being the streamers of energy moving from the three powers of the deity. These are the mysterious lines of energy that are also seen moving from the heads and hands and hearts of Eastern deities. This macroprosophus, or the long face, rises above the horizon of infinites like a sun rising from darkness. And because this horizon of infinites resembles more than anything else a great ocean, it is represented as a mirror. And as the face rises above, the reflection of the face inverted appears in the ocean beneath. And therefore we have the two great faces, one looking down, one looking up from the shadows below. These two faces therefore represent the aspects of creation. Creation being a divine power moving and a great natural area moved. And the spirits of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. And the firmaments were divided. And the heaven which was above the earth was divided from the heaven which was beneath the earth. And the universe was therefore divided between the aspects of the two great faces, the one the reality and the other the illusion. For the inverted face was illusion, and the inverted face had no substance because it was reflected from the great rising visage coming over the horizon of eternity. Here are your two essential worlds of Buddhism, the world of being and the world of not being the world of truth and the world of error, the world of divine mind and the world of mortal mind. We have the truth and the dream, with the dream merely being truth inverted. And the inverted truth becomes evil, and the inverted truth becomes the spirit of negation, and daemon as deus inversus, God or the, uh, rather the devil is God upside down. This was one of the oldest of the rabbinical beliefs of the Kabbalists, that in the material world of things, everything is apparently reversed. That which is truly the highest shall appear to be the lowest, and that which appears to be the lowest shall be the highest. And that which was apparently in the beginning shall be the end. And that which was in the end, or is in the end, shall have been that which was in the beginning. Every one of these patterns strangely inverted. Inversion to the Kabbalist impelled the concept of the perversion of power. Therefore, to these people, mortal knowledge was truth upside down. To them, the wisdom of the wise was as the ignorance of God. All mortal knowledge has to be truth seen wrongly. 
and all divine knowledge is truth seen rightly. Thus, uh, we have in both of these systems uh, the concept of false value, as recognized again in the words of Christ, where he tells that those who save their lives shall lose them, and those who lose their lives in the service of truth shall gain immortal life. Everything is the reverse of the appearances of things. So Macroprosophus, the great face, has, a great, has real meaning and tremendous interest to modern science. And I am told, I do not know that this is true, but it's been reported to me that Einstein was a student of the Kabbalah, and that he was profoundly impressed by the abstractions of this ancient knowledge, sensing in it, perhaps, the keys to grand values as yet comparatively unrecognized in the fields of specialized learning. The macroprosophus, or the great face there, or represents to a measure the space we are seeking to conquer. It represents all of the greats outside spaces. For if we put all eternity together, it forms the features of a divine face gazing down upon us, or gazing at us from the infinite and the remote. Now the ancient Kabbalists devised another term, microprosophus or the small face. Now the little face has its relationship to man in the same measure that the great face has to the universe. The little face rises in the sunrise of the soul in the human heart. As it rises it casts also its reflection upon the illusionary parts of man's nature, so that man uh, watching the sunrise of truth within his own nature, at the same time experiences the birth of error, again the inversion of the fact. And in this inversion comes also the perversion of purposes and principles. Buddha said, of course, that the primary perversion was the attempt to achieve externally in this world a degree of security that can only be attained internally. That man, therefore, seeking to perfect his outer world, was a slave of illusion, for that the primary purpose was the perfection of the inner world. Was it the intention of deity that man should perfect his outer life, then his outer life would by its own nature be stable, which is not the case. And the individual, having given sixty or seventy or eighty years to the advancement of his physical estate, finds that nature steps in and takes him away. Therefore it becomes uncertain that the perfection of this state is his primary project, that this represents to a measure the inverted face, the face of things not in themselves true, but having a likeness of truth, this likeness being the most dangerous of errors, uh, a falseness masquerading under a reasonable or attractive guise. Thus as the sunrise of Macroprosophus, or the great face, brought forth the mystery of the worlds, so the rising sun of Microprosophus brings forth the child from the womb, establishes the soul in man and causes it to be appropriate, therefore, for the universe of the human body, or the composite man, to be called a microcosm, and the universe of the great face to be called a macrocosm, terms very common in medieval thinking, but less frequently found among modern scholars. The next situation that suggests a little thinking would therefore have to do uh, with this entrance of a mystical factor, which is to bridge the interval between God and man. In uh, Christianity, this interval is indicated or suggested by St. Paul under the idea of the practice of charitas, or love. Love, beauty, unselfishness, all of the most noble of human emotions were recognized as bridges by means of which man could approach the reality in his own nature. 
This reality was not primarily intellectual, either in the Kabbalah or in any of the other systems. This, this reality had to be experienced, and an experience is, of, is that of the senses or of the emotions rather than of the intellect. The mind can attain to certain distinctions, but it cannot achieve the direct experience which is reserved for what the ancients regarded as sacred love, or that love which is permitted by religion, that love which is without corruption, selfishness, or decadence within its own nature. So in this mystery of compassion or love, uh, the ancients everywhere established their mediator between heaven and earth, between God and man. And in the uh, Kabbalistic system, this principle is also present. And in one of the later discussions, we will go into it, but all we want to express now is the fact that in the Kabbalah, an instrument or a vehicle was set up whereby the soul of the righteous might find God. This vehicle, or the chariot of righteousness, uh, had its grounding or its foundation in very deep metaphysical principles. In the Buddhistic system, this embodiment of love, of course, is found in the figure of Kuan, uh, Kuan Yin or Kannan, Avalokitesvara, the deity of compassion, signifying the regeneration of all passions in the fulfillment of the vow of selflessness. Other faiths also have this embodiment. Sometimes this principle is embodied as a person, sometimes it is presented as a, as a vehicle or a kind of means of travel, like the Chinese ship of the doctrine, but in every instance it is made possible because of a great unselfishness that there is some one being so perfected above other beings that it may intercede for the common good of human natures. This is, of course, also conveyed in the Maitreya concept and in the Horus concept in Egypt. It is certainly the very soul of St. Paul's interpretation of the Christ ministry, and it is found in a slightly altered form but equally valuable in the Kabbalistic story. Thus deity becomes in the Kabbalah uh, the most comprehensive aspect of God that perhaps we can conceive of. The interpretation goes on and on and on into infinite diversity, but it uh, is a total concept, a concept in which there is no need for beginning or end, no need for the explanation of how things started or how they will be completed. All things, being in themselves infinite, unite in the nature of the sovereign infinite. And this sovereign infinite, uh, infinite consists of the 49 paths of the Safa Yitzira, which it is said Moses, the beloved of God, walked the 49 paths, which were the mysterious numbers of the seven times seven. And at the end of the 49 paths, Moses went to sleep on the mountain of Moab, and the angel of the Lord took him into the heavenly region. The Kabbalah said that there are 50 paths. Moses achieved 49 of these paths, but was not privileged to enter the promised land, the promised land being the equivalent of the Buddhist nirvana. In order that the 50th path may be uh, achieved, there must come another who shall follow after Moses, but shall be preferred before him. And this other one, the Messiah, will be permitted to pass the 50th gate, and in so doing will open the way of salvation to all men. This is one of the elements of the Kabbalah. Now you can see how this does break through and make ground for the messianic idea or the mysterious one who is to come. Now in Orthodox Jewry, the waiting for the Messiah continues. 
In the Kabbalah, I believe that the concept of this Messiah principle is innate in the entire nature of deity. In other words, the Messiah is not a separate being from God. The Messiah is the love of God uh, added to the previous attributes so that deity becomes being, life, light, and love. And this mysterious power of love is the mysterious hidden forehead of Brahma, the power that is not to be seen in the beginning of things, but ripens out of the fullness of the mystery. For this love, again, is like the Merkava of righteousness, it is the power of the soul. And this power of the soul, though latent in deity, is that part of the divine mystery which must be completed by the creature and not by the creator. Therefore, in the process of enfolding life, in the process of growth, man experiences the rise of a new relationship with life. And as he matures, love is born as a soul in him. And it is this soul power in him which will ultimately be his savior. And it is present in deity, or it could not be born in man. But its birth in man is a voluntary act. And the cultivation of this power is where determinism comes into what would otherwise appear to be a locked cycle of God's will. This determinism being the fact that man has the power, or will develop the power, to fashion from his own nature the very bridge upon which he must cross uh, in order to reach the other shore of truth. The power of this bridge is the seed in him. It has always been present. But whereas nature will perfect his body, and reason will perfect his mind, only man's own internal Dedication will perfect the bridge by means of which he crosses from one state to another. This is the ship of the doctrine that is formed from the body of the holy Bodhisattva. This is also the nave of the church, for the ancients regarded the ecclesia or the church as the ship of this salvation. And they therefore regarded it as the symbol of concord, a design set up by God to carry all souls to their ultimate reunion with deity. In this, then, the soul of man becomes something that is called the immortal mortal. It becomes like the hero gods of the ancient times. For this, is, this soul is something that has a birth in time, but a continuance in eternity. This is the only thing which is born but does not die. There is a belief, of course, that in a mysterious way it does die, but the soul power of it does endure and does continue. The uh, identification by the Christian Kabbalists of the soul principle with the crucifixion of Christ is, I think, also worth noting, because in this case Christ representing the power of the soul does die for the sin of the world, but is restored or resurrected in due time. This concept of soul, therefore, forming a bridge, permits another aspect to arise, namely the shadow bridge, or the bridge of the inverted face. For the soul, if perverted, becomes the angel of self-destruction. And the, the perverted soul becomes the bridge to Gehenna, the symbol of the bridge to limbo or destruction. Thus upon our affections or our loves, according to the uh, ancient peoples, uh, we build the power to conceive the nature of God. And that which does not love cannot know God. And that which do does not love its fellow man which it hath seen, how can it love its Father in heaven whom it hath not seen? So to the ancients, regenerated affection 
represented by the vow of Amitabha, the unselfish dedication of the human being to the service of others because of a great love for God and man, this becomes the bridge of salvation. The Kabbalah is very explicit on this point. It tells us very definitely of this machinery, and that therefore man is building the bridge of immortality by the unfoldment of his own natural dedications, that he cannot think himself to the other shore. He can only experience himself there by self-forgetfulness, by the dedication of life to the service of life. He moves triumphantly upon this mystery. For it is said in China that when the great sage Daruma, a Bodhidharma, a patriarch of Zen, resolved to visit China, he stepped out upon the leaf of a plant, and in meditation upon the needs of China, he was carried upon this leaf across the sea, so that he was described as the sea-walking Brahmin. And when he came out of his meditation, he found himself in China, having crossed the waters without a ship. And this was because, in his meditation, he had asked that his life could be devoted to the unselfish purpose of making possible the improvement of the spiritual understanding of the Chinese and the instruction of these people in the mysteries of the true doctrine. As a reward for that, he was carried untroubled across the ocean. This is the same concept in the idea of love. Man crossed the ocean interval that divides this shore from the other shore the mysterious river we all must cross in the old Christian hymn. So in the Kabbalah, this growing, unfolding soul power of man becomes the mysterious Merkava of righteousness. It is therefore the dedicated conduct of the person that forms within itself the immortal mortal. And it is this immortal mortal that guides the traveler through the mysterious underworld of the mysteries of Greece and Rome to the final presence of the Hierophant, the Lord of the Mysteries. It is the same concept again as the figure standing in the midst of the candlesticks of Revelation. And the entire symbolism of Revelation has to do with this mysterious journey from worldliness to godliness across the mysterious ocean of doubts. It is another wandering in the mystery lands of Dante's Inferno, the journey from ignorance to truth, carried or led by Virgil, and in this case Virgil representing the human soul, for Virgil was the poet, not the philosopher. He was the mystic, not the intellectual, and the muse of great poetry, the mysterious winged horse Pegasus was the one that carried the souls of the illustrious into the wonderful worlds beyond in the old legendary and lore. And the point, the way of the point, was represented as the way of the heart doctrine. So the heart doctrine is found in all of these philosophies and principles. And it is by means of the heart doctrine that the child returns to the parent and man comes again into the mysterious experience of the presence of the Great One, whose ve ve face is veiled with ten thousand veils, <coughs> as it was seen by Moses upon the blazing crest of the mountain. All of these principles were involved in Kabbalistic speculation, and I think they have considerable meaning to us right now, and we hope you'll think so too as we go on with this next week. Thank you very much. The story of the descent of Kabbalism from its older foundations is in itself a rather interesting and intriguing account. Of course, during the medieval period, from, say, the 8th to the 13th centuries of the Christian era, uh, Kabbalism was introduced into Europe, 
probably from among the Arabs, who developed quite an elaborate system derived, for the most part, from the older Jewish mystics. After the Renaissance, the Kabbalists became an intellectual group. Uh, they had some distinction and were counted as scholars of importance. Their rising sphere of religious influence to the degree that this began to affect the interpretation of the Torah or the law resulted in some mild persecution and considerable ridicule. Both the persecution and the ridicule came principally uh, from Orthodox Jewish people who felt that a heresy was arising in their midst inasmuch as many elements of lore and metaphysics uh, came into the Kabbalistic pattern and might be regarded as producing the same effect then as some pseudo-mystical work uh, might produce in modern Christendom. By the 15th or 16th centuries, Kabbalism had really reached its maximum sphere of influence. By this time, it had attracted to itself quite a number of learned Christians. And these scholars became not only faithful interpreters of the Jewish writings, but began to interpret them in terms of Christian religious philosophy. There is no doubt that the principal church theologians of the Renaissance period were influenced by Kabbalism, and it was even taught in some of the Christian theological seminaries. Men of the caliber of Nora von Rosenroth devoted their lives uh, to the study, not of the Kabbalah in its transcendental or magical sense, but in its philosophical meaning. Sensing that somewhere in this compound was valuable and practical knowledge. With the rise of the modern scientific method in the 17th century, Kabbalism began to decline. But before it passed into comparative obscurity, it mingled its streams with alchemy and to a measure the 17th century Rosicrucian mystery. Uh, the Kabbalists also gained a new kind of fame, becoming uh, Faustian types of scholars who were supposed to have packs with demons and to be accompanied by familiar spirits. Many legends and much lore accumulated, and somewhere along the line the infamous sixth and seventh books of Moses were invented. Uh, this invention was comparatively recent. In Germany, Kabbalistic books were publicly burned, not because of anti-Semitism, but because they dealt with subjects of demonology and witchcraft. After this situation, Kabbalism in the non-Jewish world almost completely faded from view. The remaining Kabbalists were mostly in the ghettos of European cities, especially in Germany and Poland. And uh, most of these Kabbalists were rabbis, but they were not particularly well thought of by their own communities. They were not the good orthodox kind of rabbi, but strange, wild-eyed scholars dealing in magic and abominable arts. They were feared, and a certain amount of superstition that has always followed in the train of Jewry gave them 
a vestige of importance. Many persons regarded themselves as bewitched. Many kinds of magic were practiced in a time when these practices were held to be valid, and when some Jewish magician found himself hopelessly involved in either a genuinely magical or a psychologically a metaphysical situation from which he could not extricate himself, he would usually quietly seek out one of these ancient scholars for help and perhaps for delivery from possession by an evil spirit. This situation continued mildly and faintly up to the 19th century. And by this time, the entire subject was more or less considered as extinct. Not much was heard about it. We know there were still scattered scholars, a few enthusiasts struggling to preserve what they held to be an ancient authoritative revelation. But with the rise of modern science, uh, the younger men, both among the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, found little interest in these abstract theories about creation. They were inclined to follow in the ways of Darwin and Huxley and Spencer and explore the new materialistic universe that was unfolding around man. By the last quarter of the 19th century, however, certain reasonable doubts had arisen as to the completeness an adequacy of the scientific position. Science was answering many questions, but it was causing more questions than it could possibly answer. And each new scientific discovery opened a world of mysteries for which no reasonable solution could be immediately found. There was also a gradual sense of fear arising. Men began to wonder if this universe that had been torn away from its divine footings was actually progressing in a positive direction, or whether it was merely falling into a new kind of superstition, the superstition of godlessness. This led to a considerable revival of interest in Kabbalism, mostly among Gentiles, and we find that the various metaphysical movements that developed in the United States and Europe in the last quarter of the 19th century often included this subject among matters for further investigation. The 20th century found only a few articulate Kabbalists. These wrote on the subject, collated the available literature, and their findings were tucked away in library shelves and in old bookstores when only a few found interest in them. About 1925 to 30, however, there was a new interest in this subject. This interest seemingly began to have manifest itself simultaneously in two areas. One considerable area in Germany, where both Jewish and non-Jewish scholars began to take the Kabbalah very seriously. The second area was in uh, Jerusalem itself. And uh, from what we are able to learn, uh, in Israel today, the Kabbalah is no longer regarded as merely a medieval superstition. It has become a legitimate area for research and thought. Perhaps one of the helpful things that happened was that man's increasing scientific knowledge and his ability to cope uh, with world literature on a more intimate basis resulted in a new attitude toward Kabbalistic interpretation. It became possible that in the Kabbalah would be found scientific material. The structure of the doctrine was highly mathematical. It seemed almost archetypal. It appeared to have been impressed upon the Jewish folk mind as a pattern or an ordered revelation. 
Uh, to many scholars, it was perhaps the very flowering of Jewish religion. It certainly represented the motion of a religion away from a simple state of faith into an elaborate area of research, a tremendous effort to rationalize, understand, and interpret the religious doctrines of the uh, Jewish people. Again, this might have been helped by an increasing tendency of both Jewish and Christian scholars to question the literal translation or the literal meanings of Bible statements. It became increasingly difficult, for example, to accept the opening chapters of Genesis as a literal account of creation. Also, scholarship seeking for a justification for the extraordinary respect in which the Old Testament was held, began to experience difficulty in sustaining this respect on the level of the prevailing teachings and opinions. Just as Christian mystics found it necessary to their own inner consolation to seek for a mystical meaning to their scriptures and to enlarge the area of their spiritual consciousness of religious truths, so the same happened among the Jewish scholars. And to a measure, this was important to Christendom also, inasmuch as the Old Testament is an essential part of the Christian Bible. As a result of the Kabbalah, it was possible to reconcile a great deal of the difference between religion and science. In the Kabbalah, religion revealed certain powerful scientific aspects. It seemed quite conceivable that the Kabbalah could sustain and support not only our more recent opinions about the nature of the universe, time, space, existence, generation, life, and death, but might even reach into the mystery of this electronic age, describing and unfolding mysteries long concealed in difficult and archaic Hebrew words which when adequately and properly translated and interpreted in the proper context and sense, suddenly become meaningful, become intriguing and inviting of further thought. So we now find that most scientific and educational and cultural groups do not regard the Kabbalah today as an old superstition. I can well remember when even uh, progressive thinkers would hardly consider touching this subject because of its involvement in magic and sorcery. It belonged in the very outer edge of the lunacy fringe. But now uh, this fringe has taken on an orthodoxy, a reasonableness, and an intelligence. And we are beginning to realize that the so-called foibles of one generation become the solid facts of the next. Thus today, to bring the subject to focal point, the study of the Kabbalah is for the most part regarded as respectable. There will still be a number of very orthodox Jewish people who will view it with fear, who will consider it part of a divine mystery which should be left alone. But then there are also a, a number of orthodox Christians who feel that any effort to question or interpret or penetrate the outer surface of the Christian scriptures should be regarded as little less than heresy. So we have the jots and tittles followers on both sides of this situation. But the more liberal scholar, the leader in his field, the influential intellectual, is now Kabbalah conscious. And I think we will observe in the very near future an, an unfoldment of a trend now beginning to be evident of a large and generous literature appearing upon this subject, perhaps a literature that will excel in quantity at least uh, the material bearing upon the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now why is the Kabbalah suddenly of interest? It is of interest because Modern science 
is still faced with the same problems that are said to have contributed to the suicide of Aristotle. Namely, that all of the research that is being accomplished deals with secondary processes in nature, essential processes. The principles at the roots of things are as obscure now as they were 25 centuries ago. Science has many explanations for many things, but it has never touched the problems that are dealt with essentially by the Kabbalah. This does not mean that the Kabbalistic answers must be correct, but they invite a thoughtfulness because no better thought is available. If this be the case, it is quite certain that modern physicists will become more interested in the subject. I have mentioned before that it was reported that Einstein was much concerned with the early uh, philosophy of the Kabbalah. It was a kind of religious science, a science dealing with divine things, and it handled certain problems which perhaps we can summarize in a few statements. First of all, the Kabbalah, together with most religious beliefs, moved upon the assumption of an eternal God, a being in all things sufficient, an essence, principle, or power enduring, and sustaining itself by itself throughout all time and space. This power was innately and intrinsically all good and all knowing. It was absolute and in its authority and before the face of this one there was no other. Thus, existence seems to emerge from a sovereign intellect, an intellect by its own essential condition and quality, unlimited, unrestricted, and inevitable. So the Kabbalah asks a very simple, direct question that many others have asked question with which Plato and Aristotle both struggled, a question which has disturbed St. Thomas Aquinas just as much as it perturbed uh, Socrates. The question is this, how can that, which is of itself perfect, in no way deficient in anything, all-knowing and all-powerful, produce from itself a secondary state less than itself. In other words, how does it happen that from an eternal good, that which is not so good can come? How is it, for instance, that any part of creation can be ignorant if it exists within a nature eternally all-wise? If our own constitution is composed of a substance itself in turn composed of consciousness and intellect, how does it happen that we are able to enjoy so much unconsciousness and so little intellect? Also, by what reason, purpose, motivation, or authority would that which is already all in itself, beyond which there can be no more, why should this enter into a state of creation at all, for any reason, at any time? What can it create that it is not already possessed of in its own nature? In what way can creation be more than a diminishing of the power of that which is without limit and without adversary? without obstacle, without obstruction. The second question uh, that uh, probably the Kabbalists have been most concerned with is the creation of man, the evolution of species and types of life. The Kabbalists were for the most part uh, pagan to the degree that they recognized a universe of living things. The law of evolution perhaps was not so defined by them, but it was certainly inherent in their doctrine and tradition. 
Therefore we have the all good, the eternal Father producing from himself a being in his own image, empowered with his own attributes and being actually an extension of himself. The first thing that this image does is to become tempted and fall. Now what is the weakness in this image? Why is this image unable to maintain its own divinity? And how does it happen that an all-knowing and all-powerful deity permits a creature which it has fashioned in its own likeness to be exposed to a fall, or to fall, when in all substance and essence its condition must eternally be fully known by its own creator? The next question that seems to be rather reasonable and logical then has to do with the problem of the redemption of this creature, the power by means of which this creature is brought back again to the state of its own divine nature. This redemption is a slow and arduous process in which the creature, struggling desperately through the mystery of the creation, must ultimately be reunited with the substance of the Creator. This was an elaborate formula in itself. There were other points, but these are perhaps the dominant ones, and it is still questionable whether science has any answer for these. It is doubtful whether the average orthodox theologian has any answer. It is very questionable if the various religions of the world today can come together and agree upon even a mutually acceptable hypothesis. This uh, then seems to justify uh, the Kabbalists in their desperate effort to relieve their own minds and hearts of these reasonable doubts concerning the mystery of the divine nature. The uh, problem then of the eternity of deity can only be approached in one or two ways. First, is deity actually ultimate, final, eternal, inevitable, and all-powerful? It would seem that one or more of these qualities must be compromised in order that creation can take place. There must be some deficiency in deity, or this deficiency could not result in a deficiency in the creation. If there was an imperfection in deity, then the creature fashioned in its image might also be imperfect. If there is an imperfection in deity, the process of creation itself might be imperfect or subject to certain accidents or circumstances which were beyond the control and government of the divine power. Obviously, this uh, solution invites only a doubt about deity and begins to reduce or limit the power of deity. Some groups, even among the Kabbalists themselves, tried to wave this question aside with a simple concept that the nature of deity is unknowable. Therefore, the circumstances incident to the beginning of existence are simply incomprehensible by man, who must accept that which he experiences and observes but cannot attempt to analyze the ultimate causes for these experiences. The second uh, solution to the problem perhaps was most essentially Kabbalistic. It is actually innate in the Old Testament, because the deity of the Old Testament is essentially anthropomorphic. That is, it is a deity existing in a condition of great power, but also existing in the presence of an adversary, also greatly empowered. 
that the universe arises from a dual principle rather than from a single principle. This dual principle is a polarity. This polarity suggests, therefore, that there is both energy and resistance everywhere in space itself. That energy is forever moving, which is the power of God. And resistance is forever impeding, which is the power of the adversary. Now it would seem that especially in the old Jewish beliefs, there is abundant uh, ground to assume that the deity worshipped by the Israelites was not entirely a perfect god. Yet this deity uh, was gradually advanced, not only in Jewish mysticism but later in Christianity, to a condition of total paternity, total fatherhood over the entire creation. So as men began to build more and more upon the power of the one God, they became more and more involved in the desperate effort to explain how one God, eternally good, could either cause or permit evil. The more they stressed the one God, the more they forced evil upon that God as being the only possible solution uh, to the fact that the all-powerful was not all-powerful in all things. The Kabbalah goes into this in a little different way and gives us a new kind of comprehension. A comprehension which was later picked up by medieval mysticism and finds considerable expression in the Rosicrucian theories of Robert Flood and Michael Meyer. Deity as a being uh, might be regarded as the supreme or superior apex of beings. Deity was not regarded in this concept as being merely an ultimate abstract absolute. Deity was considered to be a great being, or as Plato called it, an animal existing in space. This supreme being, so-called, was certainly the leader of the creations which came from it. But this being, it also existed in something. And this in somethingness apparently had to proceed being itself. In other words, if a being exists, it exists in time and space. If it has a beingness, it has an abode. It has a certain assignment of area in space. We may assume, for example, that being is infinite, that space is infinite, and therefore that the two become one fact. But the Kabbalah points out the possibility that the infinite being and the infinite space do not have to be identical, but that actually infinite being is an infinitely evolving power growing in infinite space. This is not unscientific, but it gives to the problem this situation that as man born in this world abides in a certain place, living in a community, city, and united with others to form the inhabitants of a region. So as we look forth upon the heavens, with the infinitude of stars, with the vast pulsing mass of the Milky Way, with the galaxies extending beyond even the most powerful modern telescope, we may well be looking upon a populated firmament, an area which is peopled with gods, each of which 
in its own turn is the inhabitant of space. Within the nature of this God arises its own creation, even as within the nature of man is sustained a vast order of life. To us, the small lives within the corporeal constitution seem little better than the minutest of microbes. But in the various dimensions of space, we do not know. Perhaps the very uh, cells and atoms and electrons of our own bodies have their Plato's and their Socrates. We don't know. It is beyond us. We cannot even estimate. That which we cannot estimate because it is smaller, we look down upon. That which we cannot estimate because it is greater, we look up to. But we are not sure of the meaning of either look or the direction in which we turn. We are not sure that bigness is the secret or mystery of authority, or that smallness is the true indication of humility. These factors may be completely arbitrary, uh, created by our own minds, and having no meaning or existence outside of the intellectual processes of the Homo sapiens. This, then, caused the Kabbalists to contemplate a very interesting thought. If deity and all the great heavenly beings whose wings filled with eyes of very, are the very stars of space. This magnificent creation, this macabre of righteousness, this chariot of mystery, this creation all exists within something. Now we can proceed uh, by Aristotle's process of regressive evasion uh, to come to the simple conclusion that the only answer is that our God lives in a greater God, this in a greater God, and so on until our inquiry is exhausted, but nothing is answered. The Kabbalists did not feel, however, that this was exactly true. Uh, from my researches in the subject, I believe that they felt that there was another kind of existence apart from being. Now this might get us into trouble with Parmenides and a good many other classical thinkers. And so all we can do is blame the early rabbis working by their oil lamps. Is there something that has an existence apart from being? The uh, possible use of two terms might explain this or give us working language. This may have little to do with the dictionary, but it may be useful for us in the next three or four evenings. And that is to define or divide or differentiate being and existence. Now we can do this in a rather simple manner. Being certainly suggests a creature, a being of some kind. Being suggests an objectivity of life, a state of coordinated or integrated activity. Being suggests the opposite of not being. But not being itself does not necessarily suggest vacuum. Not being suggests a state in which a not-beingness may have its own natural condition. This we will term existence. For existence does not necessarily suggest God, but being can, especially if it is capitalized. So the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah seems to tell us that in the beginningness of all beginnings, being rested in existence. This existence came into manifestation as being. But this existence is not merely another kind of God that must keep on retiring into some higher order of hierarchy until it goes beyond reason or into intelligence. 
This existence is simply the infinite potential of life, energy, time, and space. Now these in themselves do not have to be persons. They can be like the surface of a vast ocean. Uh, they can be rich in substances and even in essences, but they may have in themselves no self-awareness as we know self-awareness. This existence may slumber forever, and there is something very reminiscent of it in the more rarefied strata of higher Buddhism, where it seems to come very close to the Mahaparinirvanic state. This state, as Buddha himself tells us, is a continuance with non-existence, as we know non-existence, non-beingness. It might almost be called a kind of existence without being, going on and on and on. Now this in itself doesn't solve too much, but perhaps it gives us a kind of wedge. And this brings to our attention some of the earliest speculations of the Kabbalists, as set forth in the writings of the Rabbi Akiba, and later the writings in the medieval period of Isaac the Blind. This essence-ness, like the ocean, cannot be regarded as a god. Even the Greeks had to create an ocean deity and give him domain over the seas. The deity ocean was not identical with the physical substance of ocean. But what was it that dwelt forever, not as a being, but in existence, indivisible from it, innate in it, continuing through it, something that had its authority from the infinite beyond the infinite, something that was old before gods were fashioned, something that goes on and on like the strange antiquity of race, so that all men are descended from an old line that goes back to a dawn which cannot be measured. And in the Kabbalah, that which exists in the substance of existence, apart from being, was called Torah. Now in Torah we have usually the concept of the law. We are of the opinion that the term Torah should be applied uh, to the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, and sometimes the sixth volume. Not, however, the sixth or seventh book which I just mentioned. This Torah, to the Kabbalists, therefore, was nothing more nor less than the absolute immutable law of existence, a law which both gods and men must obey, a, a law from which even the creating power could never escape, for it was no more possible for the Creator to fashion a universe outside of law that it is possible for a chemist in a laboratory to, to make an experiment succeed if it is contrary to the laws governing that experiment. Thus the law becomes, to a sense, existence. The law is not a person, nor an intelligence as we know it but the intrinsic, inevitable pattern in energy. It is something which we all must use. It is something that is present in every compound 
to integrate that compound. It is not the life in the compound, but the pattern determining the fact of the compound. This law can be, and sometimes was, considered to be equivalent to the will of God. But according to perhaps some schools at least, the will of God was only the obedience of God, by means of which deity moved only according to that law, by means of which all motion, movement, or existence must be regulated. This law, then, was the tremendous sleeping giant. This law was in everything. But in all these substances it was not a consciousness, but an archetype. It was not necessarily a being any more than an architect's drawing is a being. It was a vibrant, inevitable process inherent in energy. And no matter what we do or how we do it, everything accomplished must be according to the law of its kind. And to the Kabbalah, even the ancient of ancients could not exist beyond, outside of, or superior to the law of existence. Thus it is written in the Kabbalah that when the ancient, whose name be blessed, was resolved to create the universe, this great one, the ancient of days, first called loudly into space and brought forth Torah, the law, and communed with Torah and obeyed and followed the instruction of Torah. Thus grouping the twenty-two letters or the shining diadem into the patterns that were decreed by Torah. We almost have the same feeling in the great opera of the Ring, Wagner's wonderful story of the Norseland, when Odin, when Odin calls forth from the earth the mother of all mysteries, the ancient one, Erda, the earth woman, nature, the great mother who can never be denied. In the opening section of the Kabbalah, therefore, when the ancient one called forth Torah, it is written that he spoke to her. Therefore, in this context, Torah becomes the mother of mysteries. Torah becomes the mysterious, invisible, silent partner of God. And it is Torah that reveals to deity the maximum of its powers and prepares or ordains for it the processes and procedures which it shall follow. It is as though a man shall say, I shall build a house. The first natural thought is that this house must have a plan. The power to create this plan involves a knowledge, a knowledge of stress, a knowledge of construction and pattern, a knowledge of materials to be used. And if this knowledge is not adequate, the house will not be perfect. Therefore, the Great One calls forth the architect spirit to decree the way in which the house shall be erected. And in the Kabbalah, a deity calls forth Torah as the one who has always existed the one who can be brought out of darkness by will and energy, 
but also the Torah as the great mother of mysteries is the one who must be obeyed. The very concept then gives us a rather interesting point. Now this point has, has perhaps some merit to us in our modern thinking. Science, perhaps, in its desperate search after a godless universe, has pursued the phantom of Torah and has failed to recognize that this existence remains only itself until consciousness moves upon the face of the deep and calls forth the world. Thus, the anthropomorphism of the Kabbalah is not good and evil, but God and law. We have assumed a certain despotism. Kings make laws and break them at their pleasure. We have invested celestial royalty with these attributes. But at the same time, we are inclined to believe ourselves that although the laws of men are corruptible, the laws of heaven may not be corrupted. Perhaps we will then not find it too difficult to conceive the possibility that the primordial substance or essence from which is fashioned both the body of God and the body of men has its own rules by which this fashioning must take place, and that these rules are not imposed by an outside will, but are Zen-like. They are the effortless efforts of space. They are that in which there is no need for consciousness. For consciousness is not necessary for the continual motion of the law in its own nature. Consciousness is only necessary for an exceptional motion of law, or the adaptation of law to a particular purpose. The river flows from the mountains to the sea, like the Yangtze, mother of waters. The motion of this river to the Chinese was an eternal fact and was much like law itself. But the Chinese, recognizing by degrees the power of law, began to make use of the current of the Yangtze. They put little wheels in the water to be turned by the current, and with these wheels they gained a certain power to turn other wheels and stones and grind grain. Later also they sought to irrigate their fields by turning the waters of the river. They created dams and channels. Now as soon as they began this activity, consciousness took over the use of the waters. But this consciousness was not all-knowing. And as a result of that, many of the efforts to use the waters led to tragedy for man. And this water which also supplied him with his water of life was the same in which he could drown. So in the uh, great mystery of space, the Blessed One, the Ancient of Ancients, whose name be glory, as the sovereign conscious intellect called upon the law to use the law. And the law, in its symbolic sense, made a covenant with the ancient of ancients and said in substance, not verbally, but in principle, Obey my rules, and I will make you the greatest of the kings of the world. Disobey my rules, and I will destroy you utterly. Therefore, God, being of all wisdom, 
possess the wisdom of obedience. God, being all good, used law only for goodness. God, being all mind, administered law with mindfulness. But actually, this mysterious power was the dynamic. It was this dynamic, then, by means of which the emanation or existence of the world became possible. Creation, then, was simply an unfolding of the will of God according to the law of existence. It was an unfolding within law, for creation itself was a monument to its own law. For it had its origin, its beginning, its infancy, its childhood, its maturity, and its fullness of years. It became populated with orders of life, and every one of these lives was under law. And there was no power within these lives to raise their hands to heaven, to ask to be released from law. Therefore, all that heaven could do was instruct man in the keeping of the law. We may not fully agree with all of this type of thinking, but we must admit it was a rather grand idea. It was tremendous in its implications. The law itself, by its own nature, created the concept of good and evil. Law's, law was not good, because it was not a being. God, uh, by cooperation with the law, might be termed good, because good is that which wishes, desires, or impels the fulfillment of truth. But the law itself was neither good nor ill. It was simply of its own kind, its own nature, and its own eternity. While eternity rested, law was not obvious. And Birmi, the German mystic, brings this out very clearly. There is no manifestation of law until the processes of creation begin. Then these processes flow according to law and are molded by law into the everlasting likeness of itself. Now, law also, because it is not a being, because it is not of ambition or of thoughtfulness or of any particular plan or purpose for its creation, for the thing that it does, law simply operates while creation exists. And if and when creation ceases, law retires into its own unmanifested root. For without creation there can be no manifestation of law. Therefore, if a creating power determines the end of its own creation, then the laws governing that creation simply subside again into existence. The creation cannot exist without law, but the law cannot be knowable without creation. And law in an uncreating state is simply silence. The eternal expanse of unconditioned potential. In the Kabbalah, this concept of space law was held to be feminine. And perhaps in this sense of the word, uh, the average ardent feminist of today will not object to the usage as being uh, detrimental. This is no disparagement. Actually, it seems to tell us that even God must obey that this eternal mother principle 
is therefore supreme in space. Now, why would we assign this concept to a maternal polarization? Obviously because the existence of existence itself sets forth the area in which a creational process can occur, and the operation of will upon no man hath ever lifted. So the veil of space hides within itself one half of the Torah. One part of the law is always revealed and the other part is concealed. And even the Ancient of Ancients was not permitted to see the hidden half of the law. Again, like Odin in Nordic Mysteries, who was not able to read in the, no in the works of the Norns and the Fates the mystery of his own destiny. Torah rising became, so to say, the bride of consciousness. They were united in a strange, mystical, magical betrothal. And out of this union there came forth the radiant power of a new being, inwardly invested in law, outwardly invested in glory. And this new being now stood triumphant as the great archetypal androgen, the father-mother, the Ishvara of the Hindus, the one who was able, therefore, to create totally from itself, because it had already united within itself the two great polarized attributes of space, being and existence. Torah also plays another interesting part in the story of the Kabbalah. Torah in substance and essence is forever concealed. But by the very act of divine creation, Torah is caused to become revealed. Therefore, that law which in its substance is hidden is in its manifestation revealed through all creational procedure. Thus, one may behold the veiled form of Torah in the mountains and in the oceans and by the shores of the sea. Torah is shown to us in the turning of the wheels of industry, in the building of our great institutions, in the laws of policy and statescraft. All of these are but the gradual revelation of Torah. For that which is revealed by the process of creation is the immense pattern of framework laws upon which creation hangs, and without which the conscious being is unable to fulfill its own purposes. We have the same again in the mystery of the microcosm. Man, coming into birth, according to the Kabbalah, came into manifestation as the result of the uniting of consciousness and existence in the form of the energy fields of its parents. And where these fields met a strange vacuum, which was actually a blending in perfect equilibrium of these two principles, formed the door through which the soul entered into generation. But once it was born or conceived, this soul begins to manifest the law, and the law of existence begins to take shape in the embryo. The law of existence begins to fashion the bones and the sinews. The law of existence as the great architect designs the whole strange compound fabric of our bodies, our emotions, and our minds. And finally, when man stands forth, his consciousness is still hidden 
but the law that fashioned him is revealed. It is himself. Yet this law is not a being. Man does not say to his bones, obey me. Man does not say, I will have them differently. Man says, these are my bones. This is my flesh. Therefore, these are my attributes, and with these I will labor. So man accepts the pattern devised by law, brought forth by law, guarded by law. And he must go further. He must give his final allegiance to this law. For if he corrupts it, breaks it, or violates it, then the power of his consciousness to function is correspondingly diminished. This applied to the macrocosm, or to the workings of the great face, the macroprosophus, means that in the same way, divine consciousness may labor through the body which it has fashioned, but in its labors it must protect the laws of that body. For if consciousness does not protect the body, it loses the power to express itself in this area or field of manifestation. So even the power of will must obey the law of the inevitable. And the struggle between will and inevitable might almost seem to be the struggle between evil and good. For finally the law must be good, and that which conflicts with it must be the evil. From this point it is not entirely impossible uh, to conceive of the struggle between will and the inevitable. It is possible to understand the rebellion of the angels and the pride of Lucifer. And it is also possible to understand the establishment of Michael as the psychopompus of the armies of heaven, the hidden God of Israel. For Michael was the archangel of the law, a form of the great power that was gradually and inevitably to be revealed in the nature and substance of Metatron, the angel of the face. In this same mystery then, Torah, or the Great Mother, finally becomes revealed in that all parts of things which are of themselves organic, or functional, or arise from compounds, which in nature are dissolvable, and must be sustained by will and law. This mysterious existence becomes even more than the rainbow of Noah, a symbol of a covenant. For the fact that we are, the fact that we exist as we know ourselves, proves that we have a covenant with law. And it is also the same type of proof which by reverse outlaws the lawless and causes them to vanish from the face of the Lord. When, however, the law is carried forth in glory, not a glory luminous because it is constantly emanating visible splendor, but glorious in the sense that it is not necessary, as Lord Bacon says, for God to convince man by extraordinary means, inasmuch as the most ordinary means are themselves sufficiently magnificent. This concept, therefore, is that the glory of the Lord, or the glory of the law, is made manifest in all things. It is present everywhere. It is present in the growth of the tree and the rising of the sun. No exceptional glory is necessary that the law may be revealed. But the revelation of the law 
was given its own symbolic form. And when Torah, the mother of mysteries, had become invested in the eternal and inevitable forms of things, in the infinite diffusion of the evidences of law, everywhere operating, everywhere uniting in a wonderful symphony of coordinated purposes. When this glory strikes upon the consciousness of the mystic, when he is suddenly filled with the wondrousness of it, it is then said that the glory becomes Shekinah, and that the mother of mysteries is known before the face of the world as the mother of splendors. And the Zephah HaZohar, the book of the splendors, is therefore the book of the splendors of the glory of the Shekinah, the splendors of the revelation of the law, the revelation of the silent mother at the root of life. Now, if we uh, realize this interpretation of the Shekinah, we shall know why it stood as a column of smoke by day and a pillar of flame by night, and how it led the children of Israel out of bondage across the mysteries of the Red Sea and finally to the Promised Land. The glory of the Shekinah was the covenant, the proof that the way of Israel was a way of righteousness, and that the children of Israel were obedient unto the Lord. This glory of the Shekinah, according to the medieval Kabbalists, is peace among the peoples of the earth. It is the good crop rising from the ground. It is fertility, the laughter of children. The Shekinah is faithful men, not only bending their heads in prayer, but bending their backs side by side in the service of each other and the common good. The glory of the Shekinah is that peace, order, tranquility, by means of which is revealed that that people have kept the law. Therefore, happiness is a form of the Shekinah's radiance, reserved for those who have fulfilled the doctrines which are of old. If, however, man breaks his covenant, then the Shekinah's glory fades, and man wanders in darkness and in the desert of waiting, and he knows not where to go, for the face of the Lord is turned from him, and he dwells in evil. This symbolism, while again it is rather a poetical extension of ideas, suggests more meat than might first appear. It suggests a relationship in life between the individual who plays now the part of God and the inevitable with which he is surrounded and to a large degree permeated that man is truly not a free agent, nor was God. Both God and man have a power of limited determinism, and this power gives to each the right to use the law, to use this infinite supply, which corresponds very strongly in the early symbolism of the building of the everlasting house as a strange and wonderful reminder that Solomon, the Lord of Israel, played the part of the great geovestic God and the mysterious friend, Hiram, king of Tyre, who joined him in this undertaking symbolizes the mystery of the concealed pattern, the Torah, whereas the architect of the temple was the revealed law, moving into objective manifestation and building the house according to the law. 
So the great one of antiquity, the ancient face, built the house of existence in existence, built the house of his own being according to the law. And because it was built according to the law, it was acceptable before the law, and the living God dwelt therein. This concept, therefore, points out several important uh, uh, situations of which I think Buddhism adds a certain clarifying note. Actually, if law is in the ultimate, superior, and in its own nature, totally suspended, then in the Kabbalah we can understand why even the Great One, the Holy of Holy Ones, could demand nothing of the law, but could only entreat it, could come to it only uh, requesting a favor. And, and the law rising before the face of the Ancient One did not reveal her face even to God, but spoke from the strange veils that concealed her nature, and her voice was as an oracle. And she said unto the Ancient of Ancients, It is not meet nor seemly that a great king should be without a kingdom. This was the statement of the law. And by the power of the law, therefore, the Holy One was empowered to bring forth his world, to set forth his generations, much as in the story of the Greek creation myths of Hesiod and the Orphic theology. Therefore, with the sanction of the law, the Great One brought forth his kingdom. And because the law was forever veiled and concealed in its own essence and substance, it is also said in the Kabbalah that when the streams and the rivers mingle, who shall know the compound? That in this great process of creation itself, the operations of law became so strange and mysterious, that the mind of neither God nor man could fully comprehend them, because the law was infinite, and all minds must be in some way finite. The law was infinite, and even consciousness, because it was consciousness, could not be unconsciousness, therefore could not be complete. Therefore, light, by its very nature, cannot be darkness, and the mysteries of the darkness cannot be known to the light. For wherever the light goes, it hides the darkness from itself. Now, this is a very interesting point, for it tells us, therefore, or causes us to come to the comprehension that in the processes of creation, the mystery of the interaction of consciousness and existence, universal will and law, resulted in a series of intermediate conditions, conditions in which one condition imposed itself upon another. The attributes of one law impinged upon the manifestations of other laws. And there, are, there arose a vast net of lawfulness. This net was not evil, but it was the strange interweaving of infinite law in its infinite manifestation. And this strange and wonderful interweaving brought with it a, com a strange complexity in which life itself could not quickly untangle the threads of this snarl of cosmic process. 
So that even man today, where the analogy is always brought back to man in the Kabbalah, that man himself, though of the greatest righteousness and of most saintly nature, even Moses himself, could not in all things keep the law. Therefore, being unable to fully comprehend that which was in excess of its own comprehension, man inherited the mystery of death. For death is merely the ultimate incapacity of the conscious being to achieve an absolute harmony with the eternal pattern. Thus all things, by falling short of the law, fall short of their own survival or of their own continuing existence. And through their falling short of their own perfection, they are therefore subject to the infirmities of imperfection. And this is no reflection upon either God nor man but the simple insistence of the Kabbalist that both gods and men are laboring with an infinite that is ultimately unknowable. But that this infinite, instead of being uh, a person hiding knowledge or a being suppressing its own good, is a vast network of available energies by means of which creating powers on all levels, whether a god creating a universe or a musician writing a song. All these things come out of this infinite reservoir of potential. But there is no being that knows the end and substance of this reservoir. Therefore, there is no being that can absolutely and certainly and infallibly determine the ultimate purpose of law. This is concealed within its own inevitable nature, and its veil no man can raise. The path of virtue in the Kabbalistic way of thinking is therefore the path of gradually increasing intelligent cooperation with law. It accepts the absolute it autocracy not of an arbitrary deity who hardened Pharaoh's heart, but of a principle beyond which there can be no appeal, the absolute existence with law co-eternal with and in itself. This, then, out of law, is the infinite productivity all forms emerge from law. All patterns, devices, structures arise from law. Both the body of God, which is creation, and the body of man, which is the microcosm. Because, therefore, this existence is the womb of all things, it is the Great Mother. For all seems to come forth from her, and abiding its time returns to her again. Most ancient peoples had this belief, and they regarded the mother principle not merely as negative or matter, but as the infinite world-bearing uh, existence, within which the seed of conscious being was sowed and brought forth the vast majesty of the cosmos. Now what does this have to say in terms of modern thinking? Do we have hold of anything uh, that might be valuable to us? Is there a reason, for example, why we should differentiate between atomic energy and God? Is there any reason to assume that this vast exploration of space has as its ultimate end the discovery 
of a being? Or has this exploration for its assumed end the realization of the dramatic archetypal pattern of inevitables by which all things are governed. Has this modern search, therefore, on a scientific level revealed to us certain, we'll say, aspects or attributes of an interlocking structure of inevitable principles that cannot be violated. The violation of these principles is a sin against law and in a sense a crime against man. Uh, this violation of principles is also a continuing detriment to universal consciousness. Universal consciousness, however, according to the Kabbalah, cannot step in and by a gentle gesture of its spiritual scepter nullify man's violation of law. The Kabbalah, therefore, now has at least a working hypothesis to explain why deity cannot suddenly terminate the lawless state of man. Now, a big theological situation can be built upon this. It becomes the only reasonable answer that the old Kabbalists at least could devise, for it was the only answer which did not compromise the essential goodness of deity did not in any way reflect upon the reality of virtue and at the same time did not cater to any form of the delinquencies of created things. This concept sort of left everything honest. It did, however, achieve this end by assuming that there was a pattern co-eternal with God and not identical with God. The anthropomorphism uh, erases its head again, but of course in a very highly abstract way. We know that Buddhism, of all the religions in the world, laid the greatest stress upon law. Uh, Buddhism went almost so far that one or two Western scholars have said, Buddhism has no God, but if there is anything that may be likened to a God in the general rever reverence of Buddhists, it is law. For them, law is that which God is uh, to the followers of theistic faiths. Buddha made a great point of the complete and total obedience to law. In this he broke from Brahmanism and the worship of the Hindu divinities. Brahma appears in Buddhism, but in a subsidiary capacity. Brahma as deity and as consciousness in space in Buddhism is subject to law which, of course, is an interesting phase of Eastern religion. But ultimate release is not found by pleasing God, but by obeying law. Only in this obedience can truth be achieved. But the byproduct of the obedience to law is that deity is glorified and made satisfied. Therefore, man adds to the glory of God by obeying the law. This would be very similar to the Kabbalistic position. Buddha now also goes on to explain that involvement in law is existence as we know it, and that the soon as the being 
becomes disentangled from the mysterious interoperation of the skandhas, this being slowly disappears. Being as we know it, then, is a network of laws. A man exists only to the degree that he is unable to fulfill the law. Existence in Buddhism, therefore, is a condition of inadequacy, because if everything is brought to a state of absolute harmony, existence as we know it disappears. In therefore, in Buddhism, we might assume that consciousness corresponds to God. Law corresponds to the Torah or the Great Mother. And when these are brought into equilibrium, universal existence as we know it is suspended. Consciousness and existence are returned to their primordial states, the state in which they have dwelt prior to the creation of a world. In the suspension of these two, therefore, there is not the reestablishment of a one God theory. But there is a return of consciousness to the field of law, where it remains until such other time as it is called forth again. In the Kabbalah, consciousness is of a nature different from law, in this, that consciousness is an evolving being, and through infinite manifestations, from the least to the greatest, it has grown up in space like a great tree. If this tree shall die or fall, then from its acorns new trees will rise, and the growth of the forest goes on forever. And the forest is composed of living beings, but the earth in which the roots of these beings gain their nutrition. This earth is law, the dark mother, the invisible provider, the sustainer, that uh, becomes benevolent when benevolently entreated, but when certain conditions arise, ceases its benevolence. When law ceases its support, the thing perishes, but law does not perish. Life as living beings, however, as populations of space, must go on. Their bodies, governed by law, return to the law from whence they came, disintegrated by the conflict between consciousness and law. But the consciousness itself goes on its way of enfoldment within law. And this consciousness, by an infinite process of evolution, becomes an eternal being, continuing in an eternal state. The being is alive. The state is life. And this difference might offer a number of uh, escapes from some of the scientific dilemmas of our day. For we now do recognize uh, what the Buddhist also held to be true, namely that consciousness itself has a kind of nature uh, which is a product of relationships and of values but at a root consciousness, unknowable to the objective sense, also has a kind of seed existence beyond our knowing. Beings return to being. Things return to existence. Now, everything is composed of beings, and every being is invested in things. The pattern is immensely complicated and involved, but the separation of forms 
by the various decays and disintegrations of existence is merely the clarification of basic classifications. Existence claims that which it engenders. Being calls for that which it gave. Therefore, all existence returns to the principle of existence. All living things to the principle or being of living things. In primitive times, our remote ancestors described this situation as return to God and nature. And in the funeral service we say that we return to the earth that which belongs to the earth, and to God that which belongs to God. This, however, was not the full meaning in the ancient uh, commentaries of the rabbis. For to return th something to the earth was to return it to the support, to the substance, to the great matrix, to the firmest and most enduring of all things. And in their speculations, the Kabbalists sought to reverse the form or pattern of the world. They considered space to be the true earth. That actually man, as the tree of the Sephiroths, was in an inverted tree. And that in reality and substance, the true earth, as the alchemists also taught, is invisible. For the true earth is simply the infinite area of existence, law, being. This tremendous earth factor tells us definitely that every compound must truly be dissolved, and that everything that is controlled by law escapes law only by its own disintegration. The moment the pattern is no longer present, the law ceases to be manifested. And as Buddha points out, when all laws cease to manifest, then the nirvana is achieved. All conflict between a structure and principle has been overcome. In this same concept, therefore, deity is now presented in a slightly different situation. And we begin to sense the significance of the messianic factor in its relationship to law. We have a polarity now consisting of the ancient of ancients, being, and uh, the Torah, existence. And when being and existence unite, they pr produce creation. But what is the only begotten of the Father? What is this mysterious something that arises also in the union of God and the law? In all the Greek and other classical schools of philosophy, there was this mysterious being corresponding in the Sephirothic system of the Kabbalists with the point of Death, where the vertical and horizontal bars of the tree cross. This mysterious other beingness that comes into uh, existence, the Son of Man and the Son of God, the mysterious messianic power is there and is present as an intercessor between being and existence. An intercessor between the inevitable of the divine will and the inevitable of the immutable law, and the inevitable that these two shall conflict. This principle is not compromise. It is a principle of mediation. It is the Gnostic aeon of the Sota, which stands glorified between the Ancient One and the splendid form of the Virgin Sophia, again the Mother of Mysteries. 
In this struggle then between man, let's say again now, as his will to create, and man as laws operating through every bone, sinew, and nerve of his body, which cannot be violated. There has to be some kind of a middle ground here. The ancients regarded this as the soul, the firstborn of heaven and earth. And the psychic factor has still remained essentially a mystery. And in the Kabbalah, the mystery of the soul was given a great deal of a very patient consideration. But being naturalists by their general thinking, and rather practical people in spite of their broad abstractions, the Kabbalists took a simple example from their own way of life. Here is an individual, a consciousness we call man. Here is, we will say, resistance. Force, power, will, energy, meeting resistance, the resistance of circumstance or on the higher level, the resistance of violated law. For when man violated the law, Torah rose in anger to the face of the Great One and demanded uh, that the lawbreaker receive appropriate punishment. Just, of course, as Juno was forever plaguing old Jupiter and no one was quite able to make out the meaning of the legends. Between, therefore, a consciousness and the immutability of law, a pattern was set up. This pattern was created for the primary purpose of bridging or reconciling the opposites. This pattern must be the immortal mortal, must be the world hero, must partake of consciousness yet also must share in the mysterious mortality of the law. This being must achieve its strange position through experience. Here we have the two great powers abiding together, God as being, the Torah as law each from the vast pinnacle of its own aloofness, pouring its resources upon the mystery of creation. Yet the solution to the mystery, the ultimate solving of the riddle, is only possible to some creature that stands in the midst of creation itself and therefore experiences in itself the operations of these two sovereign powers. The purpose of this concept was that man should occupy that place, that man should worship God and keep the law. In this sense, however, a kind of archetypal man was devised. For man himself, as a principle of equilibrium, must also bear witness to the chemical compound of will and law. This mysterious power of mingling of will and law uh, produced what Bemi termed the great patience, the strange power of the waiting, that which patiently and inevitably overcomes the mystery of the struggle between consciousness and law. And this mystery is the psychic integration of mind and emotion. For by ma mind, man seeks to conceive of the nature of God. And by emotion, participate in the inevitability of law. Therefore, man may feel the law, and he may know the God. And out of the blending of feeling and emotion, uh, feeling and thought, therefore was created a psychic entity, an experiencing mind, the mind of the great pity, the mind that was aware 
of the sorrows caused in the confusion of the middle distance, the mystery of the aeon that died for the aeons in the Gnostic philosophy. This uh, problem then becomes the next essential secret of the Kabbalistic system, and that is the one that we have to take up next time when we will go into the problem of Michael and Metatron, the angel of the face. And so I guess that's about all for this evening. The old Jewish doctrine tends to flow into Christianity and be reconciled by whatever means is available. Therefore, as our primary subject this evening deals, at least in part, with the Messianic idea, I think we should investigate it somewhat in its own Aramaic uh, setting, in order that we can understand it better. Our word, Messiah, comes from an ancient word meaning the anointed. Therefore, it is a person or a being set aside by a kind of rite, a ceremony. To anoint meant not only uh, to accept into the family of the redeemed, it also meant to bestow a certain kind of destiny. The destiny of continuing a certain way of life. The anointed person was subject to restrictions and rules to punish conduct, which those who were not anointed were not required to maintain. Uh, the Jewish religion in its older times did not have the same concept of a Messiah uh, that we know today. For example, uh, the idea of a personal intercessing power, something to intercede between God and man, the emerging of a purely spiritual Savior. These concepts did not belong to the early period of Jewish philosophy or metaphysics. The Messiah to them was a savior of Israel, and by extension of non-Israelite people as well. But it was a savior in the sense of a restorer of the temporal power of the Judean kings. It involved both the idea of the priest and the king forever, even as in the ancient concept of the Melchizedek. Thus the Messiah of the old Jewish people was a temporal sovereign, one who was to rise up to restore Israel. This temporal sovereign, of course, spoke with the authority of God. He was one raised up by God for the restoration of Israel. His ministry was foreordained and predestined, but he came not primarily as a teacher, but as a king, as a great princely person who should rule righteously over the tribes of the children of Israel. It also followed that under the rulership of this messianic ruler, Israel would flourish. Peace and tranquility would be upon the land. All men would dwell together in peace and in security and in fraternity. 
For this wonderful kingdom of the Messiah was in every sense of the word a righteous kingdom, a kingdom in which all good things came to pass, and in which the power of evil no longer afflicted the righteous and the God-loving. So with the Messiah came this concept of a temporal golden age, an age unto foreverness, in which the people would go on and on under the wise king and those who came after him, <laughs> his proper and legitimate successor. And there would be forever peace upon the world, and the struggles and the sorrows of ancient days would be no more. Now it would obviously follow the speculations along this line would be influenced very largely by conditions through which the Jewish community passed in its rather long and troubled history. And evidence shows that the importance of the Messiah increased whenever the temporal security of Jewry was threatened. The Messiah, therefore, became a hope image. The more terrible the difficulty, the deeper the sorrow, the more desperately the devout clung to their concept that there should rise up among them the Redeemer of their people. Thus we see during the Roman period of domination, not only the rise of Messianic leaders, but even if we may say so, the rise of pretenders with the result that a great deal of sorrow and disappointment came into the Jewish religious life. Everywhere men were hoping, and the Messianic leaders could either be of the nature and quality of men like John the Baptizer, all of the prophecies concerning the Messiah are probably in the book of Isaiah. Yet a study of this book shows conclusively that we are not to understand or interpret it as we might one of our own more recent scriptures. The Messiah of Isaiah was a symbol, a being invested with the fulfillment of the need of Israel a being hearkening to the cry of Israel for the restoration of virtue. Between the suffering of the people and this messianic ultimate was a dark and troubled period arising from the disobedience of man. The human being, having fallen away from truth and of virtue, having descended into the corruption of life, was therefore deprived of the blessing of the advent of the Messiah King. Two schools of thought arose upon this subject. One was that man himself must mend his own way, must return to the simple paths of virtue and integrity, and when man lived the life as revealed and given in the Torah, then the Messiah King would come to reward man for the virtues that he had learned to practice from his own need and understanding. The second school was that the Messiah would usher in this better time. The corruption would not end until the Messiah did come. With the hour of this coming, no man knoweth, for the mystery rested forever in the divine will. Thus we see two different aspects of one problem, one in which man must earn his salvation, and the other in which salvation must be bestowed, because man himself did not have the power or understanding to achieve this most important and noble of all ends. 
As time went on, a Jewish mysticism began to mingle its dreams with Islamic metaphysics and the rising theology of medieval Europe. We see the Kabbalistic position emerging more and more strongly, which again is a highly mystical or metaphysical tradition. And I think the modern Jew of today more or less favors this metaphysical or mystical approach, which is not in substance so very different from that of the modern Christian. The tendency now is to regard the Messiah no longer as a temporal king, no longer a ruler over Judea, although the Zionist movement did emphasize this at one time. And there are still Jewish people who firmly believe that the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem is an ethical marker in the development of Jewish history, and that after the restoration of the temple, the possibility looms large of the restoration of the Judean king. Our way of life, however, more or less changes this perspective. There does not seem to be so much of the old glamour in the idea uh, that uh, the state of Israel may become a full functioning and permanent member of a family of democratic states. The concept of democracy does not lend itself to the legendary and lore of the old house of David. So by degrees, the older interpretations are fading out. And the concept today is, for the Jew as for the Gentile, uh, the hope of the rise of a spiritual leader who will restore the integrities and values of man and will lead all men of good hope, good understanding, and good character out of the desert of uncertainty into the promised land of integrity, serenity, peace, and justice. Thus, by a rather circuitous route, the old ideas have descended to us. And of course, for the majority of believers, the metaphysical aspects of the problem are merely sexually considered. There is not much emphasis upon them because they seem to lead into strange byways which are not productive of immediate good. Yet these metaphysical phases have their own natural importance, not only in religion, but in philosophy and in the modern sciences of psychology. So we want to pause for a little while and examine some of the neglected areas of thinking relating to this very interesting and truly remarkable subject. Among the Jewish people, the highest of all the hierarchs of spiritual beings was the most magnificent angel called Metatron. Metatron was called by some the angel of the faith, others the angel of the present. Still others regarded Metatron as the herald of the eternal one. He moved forth out of the presence of deity and carried the story of deity and the divine will throughout all the parts of the world. The origin of the angelic being, Metatron, is not very clearly set forth. But there is certainly evidence that this being was known, recognized, regarded, and included in the religious philosophy of Israel, at least as early as the 7th to 10th centuries B.C. Therefore, it belongs to one of the old beliefs and traditions of the people. Now, there is also a belief current among the older mystics uh, that the origin of the story of Metatron came from the mystery of Enoch. The mysterious one, the prophet of old, the teacher who was permitted to walk with God. The book of Enoch carries some references and intimations of a mystery 
but nothing is complete as the problem with which we are concerned tonight. But one thing is interesting. It is said that when Enoch ascended to heaven and was reunited with the divine power, deity caused Enoch to become metatron. Therefore, that this angel was actually the ancient, rather mystic, mysterious and mystical patriarch Enoch. And later, according to the same account, this angel, Metatron, came to be known as Messiah, or the one who was to bear witness before the world of the will of Israel. And in the same ancient uh, Kabbalah and commentaries, it is stated that the soul of Enoch entered into the soul of Jesus. And that therefore, Enoch, Messiah, Jesus, Metatron, all of these elements are tied together in one or other phase of the messianic report. It is quite probable that the early writers and commentators on the New Testament were aware of some of these parallels and involvement, and it may also quite have been that some beliefs or traditions relating to this were particularly current or held unusual interest at the time of the birth of Jesus, inasmuch as he was born in one of these critical periods in which the messianic concept was uh, pushed forward very heavily by the Jewish people in their great temporal calamity. All of these points cause us then to attempt to go still deeper to see if we can what the basic underlying philosophy bearing upon this problem might well be. Uh, we know that this philosophy will have to be drawn from more than one source, even as old Jewish philosophy was drawn from more than one stream of cultural descent. One of our most helpful uh, contributing sources would be Egypt, where a great deal of the wisdom of the old Jewish people seems to have originated, especially as we are told definitely that Moses was most learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians. Last week we took up the phase of attempting to understand the rise of an anthropomorphic uh, universe, a universe in which two principles or powers held certain sway over the state of existence. The positive and aggressive principle being in this case the power of deity, and the so-called passive principle being the power of law. Deity operating through and with law, bringing forth creation. So that throughout all structure, creation was a lawfulness. We observe in the old Jewish writings a considerable lack of what we might term emotional warmth. The old scriptural writings are very much the idea of the law and its inevitable pressures and meanings. The law is summed up in the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments. It is also summed up in the powerful concept of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And down through the involved structure of both the Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmuds, we find Jewish, Jewish truths and the legislative phase of Jewish religious philosophy. And in these uh, brackets, we observe the sternness, uh, the, the heavy burden of principles dwelt upon, uh, intensified by study, so that everything becomes a series of precedents about principles or convictions or revelations and the learned body of the Sanhedrin, sitting in meditation upon the Torah, upon the law, 
listening to the elders upon the interpretation of the law. This process determined the moral life of Israel. Now it is rather obvious that a people growing up through a series of emotional catastrophes would have certain needs of consciousness which could not be fully expressed in the concept of the eye for an eye and the tooth for a tooth. That there had to be something greater, uh, something by means of which man was bound with a strong tie of friendship to the divine powers that administered his destiny. In the speculations about these things, the being metaphone seems to come forth with a strange and wonderful dignity. We might also mention uh, this other factor that was involved in this, and that was the relationship of the Archangel Michael to the entire mystery of Jewish religious philosophy. Some of the medieval Kabbalists were of the opinion uh, that Michael was a kind of secret god of Israel, that while the populace and the people worshipped at the great altar of the geobastic concept. The learned, the deep, the mystical, the enlightened recognize the Archangel Michael as the psychopompus, the Lord of Souls, the most powerful and mysterious of all the agencies of heaven. Michael and Metatron were sometimes intermingled, and their various attributes confused. But out of the general confusion, there arose a representation of a secondary power arising in the interval between God and law. That God and law simply were not enough. That between these two, there had to be an equilibrating force, a balance set up in space. And that the purpose of this balance was essentially to reconcile the manifested attributes of God and law. In essence and substance, God and law were reconciled. But as soon as law began to manifest, deity correspondingly ceased to manifest. The universe became very largely a manifestation of law, not of God. The oceans and the tides and the regular risings and settings of the sun, these were manifestations of law. And we have a situation in uh, the rise of the early Jewish religion that we also find in India, in China, and even among the Buddhists. Gradually, the primary deities is forced back to an almost unknown estate, almost unrecognized. And in its place comes forth a new concept of deity, a concept closer to men's understanding and contemplation. Now we have, for example, in Christendom, a great many houses of worship. The majority of these houses of worship, however, if you go rather carefully and study them, are not dedicated to God the Father. Most of them are houses of worship dedicated to Christ, or to the Virgin Mary, or to the saints. You will have the Cathedral of St. Andrew. You will have the Church of St. Thomas. You will have the Ecclesia of St. John the Baptizer. And you will go down all the way through this list. But on very few of the cornerstones or inscription tablets will it say simply, dedicated to God the Father. The fraternity of deities sort of disappeared in Christian work. It disappeared also in Hinduism, where Brahma began to lose prominence and Shiva or Vishnu became the principal deity of the pantheon. 
This is probably due to a phenomenon that you can observe yourself, namely that in your own experience, if you take two processes such as divine will and divine law, and you look around you, or even look within you, you will see many manifestations of divine law, but you will have difficulty in distinguishing or separating manifestations of divine will apart from law. In other words, perhaps simpler words, uh, the inner consciousness processes of God are exceedingly difficult for us to conceive, whereas the so-called external creative powers of deity, by which worlds are fashioned, by which great processes occur in nature, these come more immediately to our recognition. So we become more aware of deity veiled in laws than we do of deity apart from these laws. In fact, there is some question as to whether we can conceive of deity totally apart from the vestment of processes by which it operates in the, in the procedures of creation. In any event, men gradually seem to feel or to sense a certain difference in their religious insight. Uh, there was a distinct concept of man rising up to assist in the bridging of the interval between deity and creation. Man is a creature sought to know and understand his creator. He found it necessary, therefore, to bridge this incredible interval of qualities. He raised up his hands to the heavens, but he did not find the creator. He found only symbols of sky and light. He saw it within his own nature, but he did not find creator. He found merely the strange longings and yearnings of his own heart. Everywhere he turned, seeking to find the way to union with his God, he found this way barred by mysterious processes. And of these mysterious processes, perhaps the most dominant and difficult to understand were the very processes of law. He found cause and effect, good and evil. He found the various principles of energy. But he could not bridge this mysterious distance that led him or intervened between him and the conscious experience of the life principle of God. So along the way he began to experiment with this. And among his own experiments, one of the most simple that he made was the establishment of a priesthood. At a very early time, he recognized that among his own kind, there were some who by their very natures and characters seemed to be set aside for the worship of God. He also realized that there were certain needs for common worship, for assembly, and for the rites and rituals of faith as a means of strengthening or restoring man's remembrance of the spiritual origin of himself. So these religious institutions came into existence, and with them a pious kind of person, an individual who no longer took part in the general activities of life, but who was devoted to prayer and, med and meditation, to the transcription of ancient writings, to art and music, and to the common public service of the needy. As time went on, this person took on a number of roles. He became the physician, the attorney, and the counselor. He served in all capacities the common need of people, and he did so in the name of God, or in the name of the faith of that people. So man had the mystical kind of experience of beholding among his own kind a motion of consciousness toward God. 
a mysterious motion in which men seem to be striving to break through, to climb some kind of an invisible mountain uh, in the midst of which was hidden the shrine or the sanctuary of the living God. And the old Jewish philosophers were quite certain that this motion was not all in one direction. That men should seek God could only mean one thing in substance and essence, namely that God was seeking man. That as man moved inward towards a contemplation of reality, there came forth out of God a mystery of compensation. Here we still had a world of law, but the fact that man tried to be better itself set up a motion in law, and law itself required its own fulfillment in the attainment of a more spiritual and wonderful internal mystery. During the process of this internal mystery, man also began to differentiate the attributes of his own consciousness more than he previously had been able to do. There arose in him, for example, a sensing of the essential difference between mind and emotion. He began to recognize reason, and he also began to recognize love. He was not able to early mature these concepts into a perfect pattern. But he early in our ancient writings we find clear and clear evidence of this. He early began to sense that in a mysterious way reason and love had a bearing upon the spiritual destiny of things. He sensed that reason was very close to law. That therefore the philosopher, uh, the wise man, the scholar, and the student uh, could through reason come to understand the operation of universal law. The catch in this was, of course, that this universal law, extending on and on, uh, was so involved and complicated in its procedures that man could scarcely grasp its infinity even when he possessed faculties suitable to consider it. Also, the attitude of love began to take hold upon man to represent possibly the emotion that he most liked to attribute to deity. He liked to think, therefore, that God and law could also be described as love and reason. He kind of wanted to go with the Greek who held that at the beginning love fashioned all things with the aid of law. So out of the sternness and literalness of a very primitive revelation came the gradual recognition that deity was a being possessing rational powers, possessing emotional powers, and possessing also physical attributes. And the physical attributes might be energy. The physical attributes might be those activities which are manifested in the processes of creation. But behind these activities are other forces constantly operating, one of which is reason. Things must have their reasonableness. And what is love? Or the spontaneous emotional sense of value. The old patriarch uh, in his tent in the desert was somewhere along the line torn between love and duty. He was torn between the law and his own personal emotional regard. We find this clearly stated in the uh, sorrows of David, king of Israel, and of his illustrious son, Solomon. We find in all the stories of the old patriarchs and the, and the ancient prophets uh, this conflict gradually taking shape. The conflict between the heart which wished to forgive and the law 
which wish to retain its absolute immutable consistency. And gradually, the public mind, which must be the interpreter of faith, came to the realization or came to the acceptance that love was equal to law, and that love had about it something that was lawful. Love was not a violation of law. Love was a fulfillment of law upon a level higher than justice. Also in love were the qualities of true parental emotion, or parental thoughtfulness or care. And uh, in this relationship we see the gradual civilizing of religions, for at various times in all parts of the world we have seen deity suddenly warmed up or becoming toned or colored by the tremendous pressure of the, of the emotional maturing of people. So that the old gods sitting quietly upon their stone thrones, gradually vanished from our spiritual experience. And in their places were deities of participation, deities who were said as near, deities who understood, most of all, deities who were patient with the weaknesses of men. This arises in the contemplation of the old rabbis. And out of this entire procedure, undoubtedly came forth the messianic concept. The concept that was created, as one old scholar said, by this one simple problem, or one simple thought. Man observing some vast operation of nature, says in his own heart, if I was doing this, I would do it more kindly more gentle. I would not punish men this way. I would realize their frailties and forgive them and give them another chance. And very often we find in religion even today people who have outgrown their faith. Their own personal understanding is bigger than their doctrine. And everywhere along the line of religious life this has happened. And wherever it has happened, there have gradually come into religion new elements and new factors and new values. So the old doctrine became primarily, in almost every so-called advanced color, uh, culture, a Trinitarian doctrine, a doctrine of three powers forming deity, not simply one power. These three powers were considered to be will, or the divine a agent of creation, wisdom, the process of creation, and activity, the transformation of creation to matter, and the gradual extension of the material diffusion of life. So will, wisdom, and action, or consciousness, intelligence, and force, or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or wisdom, love, and action. These different polarities were sensed in the divine nature. Out of this came gradually in the Christian concept the doctrine of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The three persons, one person. Three aspects of one power. But these aspects necessary because man had discovered and differentiated their influences in his own conduct. Therefore, they could no longer be denied to the conduct of universal power. The Creator is then rounded in his own concept and in man's concept of him. He not only fashions, uh, thus bestowing his life upon creation, but he becomes the truly human parent who also becomes the continual protector of that which he has created, providing in space not merely a furrow in the ground into which seed is cast, but a home in which all the elements of a moral society are envisioned as existence. 
Out of this new relationship, therefore, comes the loving father, the protecting father, the father who forgives, the father who relents. The Father who is not merely a God of justice but of mercy, a deity in, whom, in whose nature all the weaknesses and imperfections of man's uh, constitution are experienced or known, for whereas man may not know God, God by virtue of its own divinity may and does know man. And it's the power of the superior to know the inferior which as Buddha points out, causes the superior always to assume a full paternity, an attitude of greater understanding and greater love and patience. So in this situation, uh, the ancient mystical concept was that out of the spiritual experience of deity and out of the spiritual experience of man searching upward, uh, a miracle of circumstance occurred. Man rising from his own ignorance and searching further and further into himself and into space in quest of spiritual consolation sought to create some form of bridge between himself and the invisible. This bridge was his own rising psychic nature. This bridge uh, balanced the mystery of spirit and body, or of God and law. Because now in this interval was placed a mediator, a common ground which partook of both the superior and the inferior. At the same time there rose in the divine nature also this spirit of mediation. This spirit which could not manifest in man if it was not already in the power which created man. Therefore, if man can seek a fuller and more sympathetic understanding of life, it is only because he has been endowed with faculties which make this possible. These faculties rise also in the divine nature. So in the nature of deity, there came the mysterious power by which it began to understand man. But the relation was no longer that of a king and his people. But the king put upon himself a disguise and went forth as did Solomon to wander the streets of his city to know how his people lived. In other words, the divine autocrat began to disappear, much as in the case of Akhenaten in Egypt. And the king, as the responsible leader of his people, the king is Paris, the god king, as father, began to take clear shape in the formation of religious convictions. To do this, therefore, deity had to gain this mysterious awareness and it is said in the ancient writings, to achieve this end, deity took flesh and dwelt among us. Now you'll find the Greeks anticipated this process also. For in their legends, whenever the deities are in need of information, they come down to earth, take upon themselves mortal form, wander unknown among men. The same was true in the ancient Nordic and Gothic writings. And it is believed in India today that some lowly mendicant you meet along the roadside may be the deity Shiva, still wandering the earth to test the souls of men. So in the old beliefs, this supreme sovereignty projected from itself attributes or aspects of its own nature. Beings became embodied for the purpose of exploring into the psychic mystery of human life. Just as surely as we, under some conditions, may search in a foreign land to find out how other people live, and having discovered the truth 
become very much concerned with this discovery and try to solve the problems that beset others. So in the ancient belief it was held, the deity became more and more mindful of its people, just in the same ratio as the people became more mindful of deity. And out of this mutual mindfulness, there was built the world soul, which was the mindfulness of God, and the human soul, which was the mindfulness of man after God. Now this point is rather intriguing because it would indicate that the structure of the soul might be subject to further analysis. The soul actually represents, therefore, a reaching, a reaching out towards something necessary. It is a reaching out to experience something, and the very substance of soul is, therefore, its experience capacity. The soul of deity, the universal soul, is reaching downward into the mystery of the abyss, of that which is unknown. The human soul is reaching upward into the mystery of space, of that which is not known. All material things seem to be reaching out toward the mystery of eternity. All spiritual things seem to be converging upon man himself, as though there would sometime be a strange and wonderful mingling of these two vast motions of life existence. There is no doubt in the world uh, that gradually the personification of the mysterious soul process was the basis of the messianic concept. We find this also in medieval Europe among the Christian mystics at the time of the rise of alchemy. We know that the alchemical researches and speculations, the strange fantastic accounts of the gold makers, that these were primarily explorations of psychic life the discovery of the soul power. And in all instances, the stone or the mysterious elixir of life, the universal medicine, the agent of transmutation of base metals into gold, this mysterious agent was nearly always symbolized under the likeness of Christ. And it was believed that the life of Christ was the perfect textbook for the regeneration of metals. This psychic mystery, therefore, did tie very definitely into a concept of regeneration centered upon the existence of a messianic power or a third balancing factor between the two great opposites. Pythagoras points out this definite point when he insists that the primary numbers arrayed against each other, the one and the two, could only be brought into equilibrium by the three. That the one represented God, the two represented matter or law, and the three represented man or soul. Therefore, that man actually because of his unique position in nature, he is the embodiment of this psychic middle distance. That man is born a living soul. That as a soul, he is an inhabitor of a middle land called Midgard in the old writings. That man, therefore, has as his own nature and proper birthright the power to exist in a material state by virtue of body, and also he has the birthright to live in a supermaterial state, or a divine state, by birthright of the spirit within his own nature. In man, spirit and body are also linked by the compound substance of mind emotion, or the psychic vehicle. Man is therefore as much a part of the trinity as the other part. For God is truly the embodiment of spirit, 
The universe is truly under the laws governing matter, and man is under the integration which we call soul. And the three parts of creation are spirit, body, and soul. And man is the peculiar, mysterious symbol of soul in the Western philosophies, just as in the flower arrangement of Oriental uh, mysticism. So being the soul of itself, man represents two things. He represents the psychic rising of his own nature, and he also represents the psychic diffusion of the universal soul in space. Thus, in the old Hebrew speculations, of the Kabbalah particularly, the Messiah is man. Yes, the Messiah has the number of the man. For the Messiah has the number of Shaddai, which is the great, the most powerful the number of man. Man, therefore, is the eternal symbol of the eternal soul power in space. And man, attaining to his full dignity, becomes the living soul which binds heaven and earth. Man, therefore, not only visibly but invisibly, is the psychic bridge between God and nature the psychic bridge between will and law, the psychic power or bridge between creator and creation. This important discovery had a profound influence upon the ancient mystics. For if this Messiah, therefore, represented a soul power available both in man and in nature, it naturally followed that the root of this messianic principle was in deity, in the heart of God. And the manifestation of this power in the story of human activity was in the heart of man. So that which arose in deity as archetype becomes manifested in man as fact or as circumstance moving into conduct. It would then naturally also follow that man passed from an old dispensation to a new dispensation. He passed from the dispensation of will law, or the ancient concept of the creator and the creator's retribution of power, and passed into a new relationship with existence in which he becomes, so to say, the firstborn of life and law. Not only is he thus the reasonable and proper child of heaven and earth, as in the Chinese philosophy, but he is the heir to heaven and earth, according to certain of the old Christian mystical traditions. The Messiah, consequently, is both the Son of God and the Son of Man. The Messiah is the Son of God, is the deity's psychic integration. The Messiah is the Son of Man, is the human being's psychic integration. These are interrelated, but they form, on both levels, the bridge, the link. They form the connection between cause and effect. They form the middle ground across which one nature may pass to the consideration of the other. Therefore, the saving of man, the salvation of man, is always represented by the patriarchs, the prophets, or the messianic beings that have come from God. And the power which emerges from deity is its own archetypal psychic entity. Uh, the uh, this concept of this also uh, shows itself in the idea of the kingdom. From the kingdom of this world, which is the mortal kingdom of the Judean kings, there comes the idea of another kind of kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. There is an invisible world, and in this invisible world there is also the great city of God, as St. Augustine describes. 
And over this city of God, the Lamb and the light rule supreme. There is an inner world and an outer world. The outer world is essentially the world of body. The inner world is the world of soul or psychic life. Beyond this is the world of spirit. But it is only over the bridge that we can attain to this other land, which is much like your pure land sect in your northern Buddhistic doctrine. And as the Bodhisattvas stand as the embodiments of human beings who have been redeemed and have become in turn the redeemers of other men, so actually the saviors of the world are the sole power of man which revealed and directed becomes the intermediary between heaven and earth. This sole power is Metatron, the angel of the presence. This is the psychic integration, this powerful so-called prince of the face. For when man gazes upon the face of deity, he sees not the face, but the angel of the face. He sees not the face of God, which is invisible, but the vast psychic face of the moral world, of the world with its real spiritual attributes, visible as qualities, but we cannot pierce the veil into that which is at the root of quality and remains forever invisible to us. Now the power of the psychic entity over natural law and over the will of God. This situation has also called upon mysticism for a long time. And the old scholars among the Jewish people simple and explainable procedure. Uh, these transcendental solutions belong to the divine emergencies, and I would rather see first if we cannot find some common ground for assuming that these changes were made by at least partially natural means. And I think we can rather well establish this. Now, you may wonder why all this has a bearing upon the Kabbalah and the doctrines of the early Jewish peoples. The importance lies in this very circumstance, namely, that Kabbalism is perhaps the broadest term that we have for Jewish transcendentalism. Kabbalism is to the old Orthodox Jewish belief almost in the same relationship as Mahayana Buddhism to primitive Buddhism in India, or the theological Taoism to the primitive absolutism of Lao Tse. In each instance, we see the arising of a new point of view. And in the case of the Kabbalists, uh, this presents a semi-Western face for our examination. It is a rather compact package. It involves a limited group of persons, yet it is wonderfully symbolical of the entire world procedure. Not only are we concerned with these extraordinary coincidences and the timing, but we are also somewhat concerned with the internal symbolism of the various revelations that arose in a half a dozen areas of world culture at the same time. In the symbolism, we also seem to sense a relatedness the symbolism would almost suggest that a number of people had read the same book or had become aware of the same basic facts or had attained to the same basic conviction and had then unfolded this illumination in terms familiar to their own people 
or in terms at least partly acceptable to the entrenched traditionalism of the areas in which they existed. For we must realize that all of these groups were opposed as they rose. They all passed through certain persecutions. They created resentments. They were declared to be heretical by someone. And perhaps it was this very persecution that gave to each of them the strong substance of survival. For we know things under persecution develop a tremendous strength and an integration that can never be found in more fortunate uh, environments. So we have now a world situation. And I, I think that the Dead Sea Scrolls situation uh, more or less fits into this. Uh, these scrolls are assumed to have been originally um, preserved or put away in the earth sometime in this interval between 100 B.C. and 100 A.D. We also have to remember that in these scrolls there are strong indications of a, of a heterodox attitude arising among Jewish mystical sects. I am no way convinced that these scrolls are Essene products. I do not think the Essenian community can be actually the source of them, although it may well have been the preserver of the old manuscripts. The Essenes themselves were a transition group between Orthodox Judaism and mysticism, and their entire history is noted only in these two mysterious centuries. After that, they disappear utterly from the pages of record and account. We do not know what happened to them, but they form part of this strange bridge of doctrines that seem to connect an old world with a new concept of life. How shall we distinguish this new concept of life for instance, in terms of our Kabbalism. The great book of the Kabbalah, certainly its outstanding text today, is the Sefer HaZohar, or the Book of the Splendors. This was first given to the world around the 12th or 13th century by Rabbi Moses de Leon. He insisted that he transcribed it from an ancient work. For nearly 300 years, perhaps 400 years, historians have thrown the lie to his teeth. They have said that Rabbi Moses wrote the work himself, that it had no roots in antiquity, and probably little, if any, roots in tradition. However, in the last century, our broadening knowledge of world culture has caused a general change of opinion, and even so conservative a publication as the Encyclopedia Britannica, which can never be said to give much benefit uh, to abstractions. Uh, their article on the Kabbalah uh, states as the modern point of view that it is very probable that Rabbi Moses of Leon either was in possession of an earlier manuscript or was in possession of a valid oral tradition, and that in all probabilities he was perfectly honest and perfectly sincere and entirely truthful in attributing the Zohar to a very much earlier date than the medieval scholars had admitted. According to Rabbi Moses, this work was actually uh, written about the beginning of the Christian era, just at this particularly critical time during the reign of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Persecuted by the Romans and by the more traditionally bound members of the Sanhedrin, Rabbi Simeon ben Yochoi retired to a cave with his son. And in this cave he was visited by one of the angelic host. And through this 
angelic visitor and the intercession of the early prophets, he is said to have recorded the Book of the Splendors, the Sefer HaZohar. We have at this time no reason to doubt that this book is a genuine midrash of Rabbi Simeon. That is, it was a work prepared by him, or at least committed to memory as the result of instruction which he gave. This particular work changed the entire complexion of Jewish thought. It belongs just as certainly to this transition period as the wonderful books found by Nagarjuna in the Iron Tower in India at almost exactly the same date. All this adds to the concept that prevails in the writings of Rabbi Simeon and in a parallel group of material prepared by Rabbi Akiba. A little later, Philo Judaeus, the most articulate philosophical spokesman of the Greco-Jewish school, uh, expanded this concept of Jewish mysticism far more uh, than had been previously possible and mingled its courses very closely with Neoplatonism. This was a very interesting time, a time of strange beliefs. Each people, in its own way, has explained the reason why that particular period should have produced these curious consequences. But there must have been some broader underlying generality which binds these together and makes them into one united idea. For example, among the teachings that arose among the Kabbalists, and probably uh, may be traced back to Simeon ben Yochoi in the first century, is the doctrine of Gilgulam. This particular doctrine is not commonly found in the West during the period of uh, the so-called rise of Kabbalism. The word simply means the doctrine of rebirth. Now, the Orthodox Jewish people uh, had certain beliefs about this, uh, but they were not at all clearly defined. It is held that the Pharisees did hold this doctrine in some estimation, and certain sects also regarded it highly. But with the rise of Kabbalism, it burst upon the philosophic mind of Europe. Now, here's one of the points which I think we are mentioning perhaps for the first time, and that is the descent of the doctrine of rebirth in Europe from the fall of the Greek schools to the rise of modern knowledge. This doctrine was perpetuated in Europe. It was perpetuated not only by Jewish Kabbalists, but by Christian Kabbalists. And there was a thin thread of this belief, even in the Dark Ages, and in the period of the Renaissance, and down through the dawn of the modern way of thinking, with its indebtedness to Galileo, Harvey, Descartes, and other dawn thinkers of our modern generation. So this teaching suddenly flares up among the Jewish mystics. Why? How is it that a doctrine which had so little sympathy from their Christian neighbors and so little support from the Torah should have been developed in such exquisite detail in the Sefer HaZohar? This book was widely read and was widely influential among the literary-minded Jewish people. It attacked many principles of Orthodox Jewry. It did not permit much of the psychological pattern that has always dominated Jewish personal and family life. It violated, in many respects, at least the prevalent interpretations of the Torah and the Mosaic Code. Yet it flourished in Spain, in Italy, in France, 
and was held by a large number of scholarly believers all the way down through the reigns of the Medigis and the Borgias. It's almost incredible to assume that a whole series of these doctrines moving westward, doctrines which were essentially so close to the Asiatic pattern of life, could simply have come from nowhere or merely represented the speculations of single persons. Here we have another example of the development of traditions. These traditions bore very heavily upon the nature of the divine being at the root of life. And in the rise of the Zohar, we see the Jewish concept of deity undergoing marked changes, changes which were later to profoundly influence the Christian faith. How did these changes arise and where did they come from? Were they indigenous to Europe or the Near East, or did they come from far Asia? As time goes on, I believe the general tendency will be to suspect far Asia. I think we will gradually be forced by the development of more adequate records uh, to recognize that religion is a common motion, uh, that it is like a river that may flow through one country but have its headwaters in another. And this um, diffusion of ideas was possible at the time with which we are most concerned. And it is very possible that the reason for this sudden outburst of similar doctrine in assorted regions came as the result of the maturing or developing of more adequate travel facilities, particularly uh, the increase of caravan trade. Uh, the trade was to provide luxuries for the Romans and the Latins. But the byproduct was the communication of ideas. For these traders brought with them their beliefs and their doctrines. We know that this trading process a few centuries later was to be the principal foundation for the rise of Islam. But for our present concern, I think the transformation of the nature of deity is the first matter to be considered. Our primitive ancestors gradually passed from the worship of nature to the worship of spirits, from the recognition of visible forces to the acceptance of invisible causes behind or beyond these forces. These causes themselves passed through innumerable reformations on the part of man. As his experience increased, it became essential to revise his theology, to keep his theology abreast of his intellectual achievements and his physical experiences. Gradually, the concept of deity as represented in the Mosaic Code took form, not in one area, but in many areas. And deity emerged as a being, a transcendent person. As the system was patriarchal, the deity assumed the aspect of the great father power. It was usually personified or impersonated as a most venerable person, a great superhuman being, a being, however, fashioned in the likeness of a man, a being like the mysterious and noble figure casting from his hands the sun and moon, as represented on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. This being was the great patriarch, and was compounded I think our discussion in these five talks will be rather more than usually important. 
for we hope to bring in a quantity of material involving principles and points of doctrine that we have never before discussed. And as a beginning, I would like to lay certain foundations. In the first place, however, we must bear in mind that it is very easy in an obscure area to fall into opinion or to interpret somewhat more broadly than the facts justify, especially if we work from some basic conviction of our own. Therefore, I'm not going to dogmatize any of these points, merely to bring out where possible the historical facts and certain almost inevitable conclusions. Each person, however, should weigh these almost inevitable remarks with the same uh, criticism and judgment uh, that they would use in evaluating any body of evidence or circumstantial record. I want to deal first with two very interesting and unusual centuries. That 200-year period from approximately 100 B.C. to 100 A.D. The more we become interested in comparative religion, the more we realize that this particular period has interest and importance in widely scattered areas of human culture. Of course, in the midst of this period, the Western world receives the impact of Christianity. But it must also be borne in mind uh, that the Christian faith for the first two or three centuries was a minority doctrine developing within a very restricted geographical and cultural area. We cannot, therefore, assume that Christianity of itself was responsible for all the other changes in distant regions, far from the possible contact with early Christian activity. Nor can we more readily assume that far and distant areas moved in upon the Mediterranean region uh, to completely change European culture. We must therefore move from a generality to be weighed and considered. We know that about 600 years before the beginning of the Christian era, a group of extraordinary religious and philosophical leaders arose within the space of a hundred years. Many of these men were contemporaries, and each left an indelible mark upon the culture of his own time and the area in which he lived. China received Confucius and Lao Tse, who were contemporaries, although Lao Tse was the elder man. During the very lifetime of these men, India received Buddha, another of the great teachers of the world. We have the suspicion that there was a marked renaissance of Persian culture about this time, perhaps under the last of the Zoroasters, who it is said Pythagoras of Samos was personally acquainted with. In Greece it was Pythagoras who established the foundations of the great age of philosophy, which may well be termed the golden age of Greek learning. Here were, here were a variety of impulses bestowed almost simultaneously in different parts of the world. From this period, there moves a cycle of approximately 600 years let us say, between 500 and 600. In each case, within its own area, these foundations 
late in the 6th century B.C., began to mature and evolve and develop systems of thought. We know what happened in Greece and how the Platonic philosophy rose definitely from the Pythagorean theory. We also realize that Pythagoreanism and Platonism became the dominant Mediterranean philosophies and attained this distinction between the 4th century B.C. and the 1st century B.C. We also realize that in China, the peculiar nature of Confucianism caused it to remain a very steady and comparatively unchanging structure. Confucianism was almost totally an ethical conviction, and it could scarcely be changed or outlawed any more than we could actually change the golden rule. Its very structure did not permit it to become much involved in any religious or abstract formula. But Taoism, the teaching of Lao Tse, at about the beginning of the Christian era, moved from a philosophical to a theological foundation. And we find a tremendous expansion of Chinese metaphysics coinciding closely with, say, the first century uh, A.D. At about the same time, we find a tremendous internal change in the structure of Buddhism. We find as a result of the discovery of the mysterious secret books of Buddha in the Iron Tower by the Buddhist patriarch Nagarjuna. The Buddhism moved from a lofty philosophic agnosticism into a very involved, profound, and emotionally mature metaphysics. With the advent of the Pure Land Doctrine, or the Northern School, Mahayana Buddhism. As soon as Mahayana arose, the entire course of Buddhist history changed. And while there are still groups clinging strongly to the old way, most of the progress in Buddhism has been the result of the Mahayana groups operating in China, Korea, and Japan. They have represented the spearhead of the modernism of religion in Asia. About the same period, there were marked changes in Hinduism. Uh, the rise of mystical and transcendental schools for the interpretation of the ancient Vedic and, Pur and Puranic writings. This change was also an enlargement into mysticism, a tremendous growth of metaphysical speculation and the development of systems of meditation and um, various types of mystical experience doctrines which were to play an important part in Asiatic culture. Even while Christianity was in its infancy, its direction was abruptly changed at almost the same time by the ministry of St. Paul. Uh, the Christianity of the four Gospels has gradually been absorbed into the Christology of the Epistles. And St. Paul stands forth as the person who transformed the moral code of Jesus into a highly transcendental universal doctrine of regeneration and redemption. Similar changes were occurring in Persian metaphysics, and we find the roots appearing also in Greek speculation. For about the beginning of the Christian era, the simple philosophic clarity of Plato's thinking became involved in the highly mystical speculations of the Neoplatonists and the Neopythagoreans, seated in that melting pot of commerce and culture, the ancient North African city of Alexandria. Also in this same time, cross groups began to emerge, mingling Greek thought with thinking of Christianity, and producing such peculiar 
group as the Gnostics and the followers of Manes, the Manichaean group. In all of these instances, one simple point stands out. The gradual transformation of older doctrines into highly mystical revelations. Revelations that had one essential purpose behind them, and that was to change the concept of the transcendence of deity to the concept of the immanence of deity. This is a very important philosophical point. The mysterious God of old, or the godlings of ancient times, living in their remote Olympian or Samurian heights, uh, were a race of beings apart, inhabitants of heaven. But in this gradual change that took place, Deity was transformed into an eternal power, everywhere present, always invisible, beyond definition, yet immediately available through certain transcendent achievements of human consciousness. We know that this change marked not only uh, the shift in the psychological integration of the Mediterranean region, but it had swept across the world. There are even vestiges of this change occurring in the Western Hemisphere among the primitive peoples, perhaps not so primitive peoples, of Central America. We find a gradual tendency to associate the rise of religious mysticism among the Mayas at a time approximating the beginning of the Christian era. This phenomenon was so remarkable that Lord Kingsborough, one of the greatest 19th century authorities on Central American culture, felt that it was almost certain that the mysterious deity Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, who came so strangely to Mexico, must have been one of the original apostles. In other words, there seemed no other way of explaining this, because there was no common communication between these peoples. Yet at almost one time, they all came to an almost identical conclusion, changed their entire religious course, and transformed the structure of religion from its archaic form to the type of religious understanding which we share and enjoy today. Now this obviously opens a very large area of speculation. There are many possible explanations, some rather impossible, which have still held a measure of favor. One broadly accepted uh, doctrine relating to this, or explanation for the circumstances, is the idea of coincidental emergence. We have parallels of this in simpler ways. We fr frequently hear, for example, of an invention that has been offered to the world. And it is not uncommon that the same invention shall appear in, the, in different places at the same time. Several persons coming to almost identical conclusion and at almost the identical moment. Therefore, the coincidence concept is not quite as loose as might first appear, for it is based upon the assumption that time is measured by a series of events, and that whenever a culture or a group of persons or a civilization passes through certain experiences, there are corresponding innovations in that culture, changes in its doctrines and beliefs. Perhaps the interval of 600 years between the advent of the great teachers and the beginning of the Christian era brought several nations or several culture groups to almost the same psychological platform. 
and there was no direction in which they could go except that direction which is most natural and common to human nature. Another explanation which requires perhaps a little more investigation is the concept that these changes were tied together, that actually there was greater commerce between these ancient cultures than we at this time assume to have existed that it is quite possible that by the beginning of the Christian era a degree of world thought had been established, particularly along the caravan routes. And it is interesting that most of these innovations rose in regions along the caravan lines between Europe and Asia. Therefore it is conceivable that Asiatics did visit uh, Western centers of learning. It is also quite possible that more Europeans visited Asia than we now realize. We know that Pythagoras was able in the 6th century BC to reach India. We know that the armies of Alexander the Great penetrated Asia. We do not know just how largely these motions contributed to world ideas. But one thing we can generally regard as undeniable, that the world of cultured, civilized nations came to about the same ideas at almost the same time. Of course, to the uh, devout transcendentalist or metaphysician, there is no problem at all. All these things are handled by invisible forces beyond human comprehension. Uh, we do not deny such a possibility, but we also like to see, if possible, some uh, more suited out of the elders, the heroes of long ago, the fathers of tribes, the venerated sages and scholars, the great priests and saints of long ago. All of these contributed their parts to the creation of the God image, and this God image was great of power universal of authority, but subject, like the creatures that fashioned it, to the whimsies of disposition and temperament, subject naturally uh, to favoritism in bringing particular advantage and security to its chosen people. This God image was remote, like perhaps the great golden figure of Zeus at Olympus. It was power, but it was a power inscrutable, a power with which man could have very little intimate understanding association. It was a power that ran all things according to its own will. And in this power men were but pawns in a great game. The gods could sweep away men merely by the will to do so. And these gods lived in a heaven world or region far from the abode of men, even though, like ancient Odin, they occasionally seated themselves upon the throne of all seeing and looked out upon the world to see that it was still in order. We find this kind of deity not only arising in the Near East, but having already arisen in other ancient regions as Egypt, India, and China. We find roots of it in the nature worship of Japan, Shinto. We see therefore God as the ancestor. We see God as the ancient one. And we also lived in a world ruled by certain inscrutable laws and processes an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This God was a God of justice and of vengeance. This was the deity whom men did not dare to offend. They could respect, they could fall in awe before the thought or image of this God, but they could not meet it with personal affection. It was too distant and too far, too high 
too remote uh, to have any immediate part in the workings of the world. This concept also had another frailty about it, which men as they grew wiser began to contemplate. There was a weakness in this God. For this deity, living alone in an inscrutable internal remoteness, was assumed to be the parent of creation. In the first place, man was unable to explain how or even why God should create. There seemed to be no particular reason for it, and the more men studied the creation, particularly other men, the more doubt they had in the divine wisdom in creating man in the first place. There were many legends that Deity so repented of this optimistic moment uh, that he swept away his creation time and time again. This uh, problem also caused the great question to arise, from what was creation fashioned? Did creation actually emerge as a result of a divine fiat spoken in space by some vast shadowy being like that portrayed by Gustave Doré in some of his wonderful uh, paintings. Was creation from something or nothing? From what did the eternal creator fashion his world? Was the world created or had it always existed? Was deity merely one of a body of immortal beings that like existence itself had no beginning and no end. The problem of trying to rationalize the fashioning of a world by this strange and mysterious power confused and confounded the ablest thinkers of old time. They could uh, figure nothing more than a symbolical answer like the tossing off of the sun in front and the moon behind. This, however, did not fully satisfy the rising realization of the principles of astronomy. There had to be some other explanation. This explanation uh, needed also a warmth in it. And if we look back on primitive religion, we see that there was an astonishing lack of real warmth. Men worshipped. But some way this worship was like the respect of a small child to an overstern parent. It was a respect of fear. This deity was wonderful and awful. It was a being which no one dared to offend. It was a father, however, in name only, for no one brought their troubles to this father. They brought offerings, they propitiated, they prayed, but they never felt a kinship with infinite life. This was long regarded as one of the basic weaknesses of Greek religion. Of all the religions of that period, probably the Greek was the most pleasant. It was the happiest. It was a worship of nature, and the rituals were well arranged, so there were festivities for every season. But even so, this did not represent a real sense of intimate experience. It was not until the rise of the Orphics that the human being in Greece had any real spiritual significance. He died and became a shadow. He had neither punishment nor reward in the world to come. He came forth as a flower and was cut down, and that was the story of it. It was only after philosophy began to ripen these concepts, and the human heart began to sense an internal need that it turned away from the strange theological materialism of antiquity. This does not mean that the ancients had no God. But they had no 
personal God experience. They only worship before the temple. They never seemed to go in to find that which was hidden in the Aditam. They did not walk with God. Perhaps the old story that before the fall of man, God walked in the garden in the cool of the evening, carried some remembrance of other and better ways. But in the great rise of theology, God did not walk with men. He ruled them. He governed them. He punished them and rewarded them according to his own will and fancy. Now it is quite possible that at a certain